Okay, hello everyone. It Hi. is uh, 9 a.m. San Francisco, 12 p.m. on Moon, New York, and uh, 5 p.m. London or Lisbon. Uh, I'm in Lisbon. Um, so three words about me, entrepreneur, uh, Venture Studio. So if you will uh, wake me up in the middle of the night, I will say that my name is Venture Studio because last year I did a lot of projects uh, around Venture Studios, uh, like seven months research on studios where I refer to 100 sources. Uh, it went viral on LinkedIn. Then we held two conferences in November for Venture Studios. Uh, then uh, I'm recording podcasts with uh, studio founders. Uh, we have a syndicate for studios and their startups. Um, and uh, uh, I create content about Venture Studios. So, But today is a VC online conference. Meaning there's not only venture studios, but all kinds of uh, venture funds, fund of funds, family offices, and all, all involved in venture capital. Um, so thank you for your reposts, because we got 370 uh, plus reposts, and uh, we got uh, 1,200 registrations, including 57 family offices, 70 limited partners, uh, 150 general partners, 246 uh, angel investors, 358 venture studios, and the 12 fund of funds. So a lot, uh, a lot of people are uh, interested in venture capital. Um, so because I work a lot uh, last last month, uh, I think it's about maybe 10, 12 hours a day without weekends. So I decided to put some hobbies uh, into my work, into this conference. So these are different board games. I prepared you see uh, poker set here uh, because um, I live in Estoril. It is near Lisbon. Uh, there is also a board game named Estoril. Uh, and we have the biggest casino in Europe. I checked on Wikipedia and it is right. So uh, this is why today we'll have some game uh, with poker. I will uh, explain the rules a bit later, but uh, now it is time to say that we have some prizes. These are books. Actually, I gifted um, I gifted all my printed versions, so we will uh, prepare some books to most active participants, like uh, Skin of the Game and the Almanac of Tamar Revikant. Uh, this book influenced my decisions in life uh, in many ways. And uh, each speaker will have 10 minutes for the presentation. I will show this uh, notification uh, when one minute left after the, uh, before the end of presentation. And then we'll have five minutes uh, to ask different questions uh, to our speakers. And we'll have some special comments to ask your questions. So uh, when the speakers will uh, present their uh, ideas, thoughts, and uh, presentations. Find this special comment where you have to put your uh, your question, and we'll gift here. Uh, we'll gift at, three, at least three books to most active participants today. So participate in all our activities. Um, I want to invite our first speaker, Ihar Mahanyok, uh, with the topic: How did I launch my first 23 million fund in 2023? Uh, and why and how founders should move to the U.S. to build their unicorns. Uh, so Iger is a GP at Geek Ventures, um, attracted capital from 70 limited partners. And the question to everyone, uh, please put in the chat, uh, if, uh, if you know or heard or just your guess, what is IRR of um, Iger? angel investments before he launched the fund. So I don't know, is it public information or not, but it's a very impressive number. So if someone uh, want to share, I encourage uh, to, to share the the figures. Maybe Iher will, will answer. Yeah, please, Iher. 
Yeah, yeah. So it was something like 65% IRR. It's not public, but I'm happy to share, of course. So uh, anyway, thank you for the introduction, Max. My name is Igor Mohanyak. I am uh, running uh, Geek Ventures <coughs> here in New York. Uh, I'm glad to be invited. So a little bit about uh, me and my background. So I have uh, a software engineering and a computer science background from Belarus. Then I moved to Switzerland, worked at Google, uh, worked in New York and Google, uh, Facebook and startups. And in parallel with software engineering career where I developed AI ML uh, products and uh, grew uh, AI ML teams, I have uh, been um, uh, I've been uh, angel investing since about uh, uh, 12, 13 years ago. And uh, when I started angel investing, I have been always interested in you know great teams early, seeing what uh, what I could do better with my money than just uh, invest in public stocks. And also, how can I be involved in uh, business and in startup ecosystem while being a software engineer? So over the years, I kept uh, investing more and more companies. I invested more than 150 companies before I started the fund and uh, got 15 exits. Uh, five companies went to unicorn status from seed. Um, I was the first investor in PandaDog, People AI. Uh, I was seed investor in Instacart, which uh, went uh, um, on IPO last year. Invested in also Jeeves and uh, uh, Airbyte that became unicorns. and. Um, in 2021, I started uh, Geek Ventures, and uh, you know some of you I saw in chat were in VC Lab as well. I joined VC Lab in 2021 in August. I found that this was the best way to transition from an angel investor to a operational VC because those guys really taught me on how to run a firm as opposed to just uh, you know how to pick investments, which. Uh, um, I already have to, had some understanding with uh, 150 plus investments. So in 2021, in, uh, I uh, came up with the thesis of investing in immigrant founders in the US. And uh, in a few minutes, I'll switch to why uh, this thesis. But after I found the thesis and I went through my network uh, of people I knew who were either founders or tech people from Google, Facebook and other uh, companies, and I raised first uh, several million for the first close in late 2021 and uh, started investing. So throughout 2022, uh, that was a really difficult time to invest because as you know, February 2022, the war started and in March, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve started um, uh, tightening. And throughout 2022, uh, LPs started to be, you know, it started to have less liquidity and started to be much tighter and much more difficult to raise. But because I started deploying capital already and I had not only my angel track record, but I also had track record of the companies that we invested in the first several months since the first close, and those started growing better. And like, for example, one of our best companies in the fund, Shape6R, we invested in December 2021. Another one of the best companies in the fund, uh, New Homes Made, we invested in January uh, 2022. And throughout 2022, those companies improved. And uh, all uh, and with uh, uh, my strategy that really struck a chord with a lot of people, I was able to cross my goal of 15 million by September 2022. And uh, in June 2023, when I stopped fundraising, I had $23 million uh, in the fund. So I announced the fund, $23 20 million fund, uh, several months ago. And uh, we already deployed uh, part of it. We have 40 companies in the portfolio. 10 more companies or 11 more companies will invest throughout 2024. And uh, quite a few companies are doing well, did a few uh, rounds, uh, 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 two I dimension. Shapes XR, new homes made. Spice AI was really great. We uh, invested pre seed and then it uh, raised a really significant seed. Um, food Ready uh, raised a significant round after we came in and, uh, and more. So, um, uh, and I think it's important to note that uh, the fundraising success went against the uh, against the market, right? So, ha first half of 2023, when I uh, closed. Uh, it was the lowest 
half on record uh, in terms of launches of new funds. I think overall, PitchBook noticed only 50 new funds in the first half of 2023, which is much less than any other six months period. And and it wasn't a small fund, it was a $23 million fund. The important thing was also finding the good ICP in terms of LP. For the first fund, what really worked is uh, uh, either founders or tech people who have uh, who are not rich, who don't have family offices, but who have probably made several million dollars and want to put a couple hundred thousand into a venture fund uh, to basically get some venture exposure. So a lot of my LPs in the first fund had the first venture exposure through my fund. Uh, and uh, of course, I had also fund of funds. I had some um, uh, entities uh, and some other funds investing. So uh, so there's a whole gamut. But I found that a lot of other GPs underestimate the, uh, the quality of uh, those like LPs who are probably uh, engineers or directors uh, at some uh, tech companies. So to add uh, about immigrants, so uh, we invest specifically in U.S. companies by immigrant founders. And what I found is that, first of all, immigrant founders have proven that um, they have great success. More than 50% of U.S. unicorns have immigrant founders. And that's obviously higher, uh, you know, than you would expect. Uh, and uh, a lot of immigrant founders went through significant adversity. And as we know that, you know, when people went through adversity, they end up uh, being able to achieve more uh, later. And uh, uh, going through a U.S. immigration system is another challenge. It's one of the most difficult uh, immigration systems. And then there is a very clear... Um, uh, clear incentive alignment and value add where we can help the immigrant founders. So we can, um, uh, first of all, help them raise in the U.S. And this is a very important and very uh, uh, clear that when we, um, when, what I went through in 10 years in the U.S. is building a network. And a lot of uh, immigrants to the U.S. don't have the right network to fundraise compared to, for example, typical uh, U.S. Uh, successful founder who graduated from Stanford, got uh, like connections in Silicon Valley and so on. Uh, so it's much harder for uh, immigrant founder to get to raise a round through connections. And that's where we can help because this is what I find the most obvious and most important help that I can give to any founder is connect them to the right people, help them to understand how to uh, communicate with the people in the U.S. Uh, we could do a lot of events in the in uh, New York, San Francisco and so on to get the founders into the ecosystem. And then the important thing is like why founders should move to the U.S., right? So what we find is that why don't we invest in immigrants in other countries, right? We specifically see that U.S. is the best breeding ground for unicorns. Right? It is that if the founder moves to the U.S. to build a startup, first of all, they don't need to deal with uh, language issues or regulations for many years. Right? They can do it in English. They don't have to deal with the stay with the government unless it's highly regulated industry like healthcare. Um, and they also operate on the market where customers, including both consumers and businesses, are much more open to buying solutions from startups, as opposed to Europe or other markets which are much more conservative, where where selling to uh, customers from a one-year-old startup is much harder. So um, what we see is that and uh, that it's much easier to, uh, to build a business, but it's also much easier to raise because there is obviously much more money in the U.S. ecosystem. And uh, what I would recommend is the founders can sometimes find grants uh, from other governments, especially in Europe, but also in Canada and elsewhere, if they stay incorporated in that country. And what I find is that the better companies are being minted without grants. If they go to the U.S., forego those grants, have to hustle to raise, they end up building better companies. Okay, I think that's... Uh, 
Uh, that's all I wanted to share, but we probably have several minutes for Q&A. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the question is, what advice do you have for emerging managers raising their first fund? Uh, the main advice, talk to more uh, people and also to, uh, first start with your network. So for me, for uh, to raise the first fund, I spoke probably to 600, 700 people uh, pitching my fund. And vast majority, 90% of those people were people that I knew before I started to raise. Right? So I didn't focus uh, on uh, uh, outreach and introductions and so on, meeting new people. I focused on reconnecting with people I met before and explaining them what I'm doing. I think this is extremely underappreciated. Find 500 people from your network that you, that you already know, they know you and pitch to them. So yeah, we have a special section for, for question. My question is, so when you, uh, when you described your idea, was it like a sequence of calls or like was it only one call and, and your investor was ready to, uh, to sign some, for example, pact from VC Lab? Uh, so, like this what was the funnel? I think, uh, first of all, of course, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of the LPs, it was one call and then they decided not to invest, right? So, but with uh, uh, those that decided to invest, I think half of them invested after one call, but um, uh, half invest after two, three calls. And uh, typically, um, what happens uh, is I, st- I, I, I send my deck before even the first call. Right, so that's my approach. Is that I'm being very clear that hey, I want to talk to you about the fund. Here's my deck, so you can take a look at what we are talking about. And then on the call, I try to explain my track record, my strategy, my approach. And often on the call, I have to explain how venture works overall. Right, and like, uh, well, what's the what's the returns horizon? What's the uh, potential? Uh, uh, returns like per year or overall and so on. So, and that's often, so often my first call was 40 minutes or one hour. And uh, in, in many cases that was enough to close, but then I think that my, most cases when I had to do two, three, four calls where people were more curious to understand how it works. I think I had one call for like two hours with somebody who was like asking everything about distributions uh, and carry and uh, how does the selection works, right? And what happens in this case and that case. And that was much less about my strategy and much more about how it works, right? So what I um, what I find is that uh, you can always feel if the people are curious and want to learn more as opposed to people are knocking you down and looking for red flags. So because I think that uh, when people are very, uh, I, I, I think I had only one uh, potential be like that, that would take many calls, but every call they would try to find new problem to convince why not, and they end up not investing. So, but people who are interested in investing, they would typically be curious and try to figure out more details to understand. Uh, one more question. Um, what advice would you give to overseas founders who are validating their product in other markets but eventually want to scale in the US? First of all, incorporate a company in Delaware from day one because uh, flipping from another incorporation to US is a pain and almost nobody is able to do that. It's really, really tough. Uh, second is, uh, you know, be very careful is not to uh, over overfit your product to a specific market. Because here's the thing that you might have some success in a market and then the success might be absolutely not translatable to the US because different customers, different competitors, different pains and so on. So I would say spend no more than six to 12 months in another market and uh, go to the US as soon as possible. Uh, one additional question here is, do you think uh, it would be good to partner with people in the US for startups outside the US to tap this market? I don't know what you mean by partner. Uh, of course, there are some different ways to uh, in, to find integrators, to find somebody who will sell it. But here's one important thing. that If you ever want to raise from US investors, you personally, and I mean CEO, has to be in the US. And when you are in the US, of course, 
uh, you should also find other partners and find people to help you and so on, maybe hire people, but it will be much easier. When you are abroad, selling to the US is really, really difficult. Yeah, thank you, Iker. You can also uh, answer uh, in, in the chat some uh, some questions because there are many questions I see. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your experience. Um, thank you, guys. We are moving to the next part. Um, so I forgot to ask about my team. Any uh, Masha, Olga, that we have to show what what, uh, what are your uh, hobbies for today? Olga is uh, doing filming with, so she helps us to record the, the interview podcast and uh, uh, do editing. Yeah, Masha, I, I see that she is traveling a lot and I need, oh, uh, yes, yeah, snowboard. Yeah, super. Uh, some people who visited our previous conferences know my special trick for online meetings. This is a rare skill and fun fact about me that 15 years ago, I learned some type of Japanese, Japanese martial arts. Uh, yeah, and wow, wow, wow! I see, I see many funny things today. This is super wow. Uh, you can also, uh, you can also do like swipe some screens to find some different different people with different things. Yeah, this is funny. This is funny. Super. Um, yeah, we made the photo. So I'm inviting our next uh, speaker today. David Cohen, a co-founder of Techstars, the biggest pre-seed accelerator uh, in the world, invested in 3,800 startups with a total valuation of 200 uh, billion. And um, the question to the audience is, um, in how many startups Techstars invested in 2023? So put in the chat your answer. And uh, David will uh, let know. And also, uh, Techstars invested in uh, more than 20 unicorns. So this is a very good, on pre-seed, I believe. So this is a very good direction. Yeah, David, what is your answer on how many uh, startups you invested in 2023? Uh, I think it's about 700, 720, roughly. Oh, super. I don't have the exact number, but somewhere in that zone. More than 700. So. Yeah. Okay. So you are, you are with uh, with the topic maturation of the VC asset class accelerated by the downturn. Yeah, and I try to do it in ten minutes, as you said, do it in ten minutes. Yeah, so we'll yeah. we'll speed minutes. through it. I'm going to uh, share a screen here, and yeah. um, what I what I want to tell you about is that things are changing um, in the VC industry. It, it's slow and it's hard to notice, uh, but it's changing. And a lot of times, I get asked the question. Uh, hey, David, uh, it's crazy. You're investing in 700 companies this year. Why are you doing that? Uh, that doesn't sound like most VCs. I'm like, good, because we're not a VC, uh, but we are investing as an investment business and in, in more early stage companies than anybody. And we intend to scale that into thousands per year. So why? Uh, because we believe in data. We believe in math. We believe in science. I'll show you this. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this. What's happening? You all know it. You feel it. Um, on the left, the number of funds being raised, much lower. The amount of capital being raised, much lower. On the right, the number of unicorns being created that the venture industry seems to depend on in the classic model, way down. Uh, back to sane levels. Uh, it got really insane there for a while. So we're seeing an unprecedented and actually a very profound reset of the venture uh, industry. There are going to be fewer VCs. There are going to be fewer unicorns. They got to deal with it. Um, so alternative venture models like studios, like accelerators are going to be more relevant as investors chase companies that are not just the unicorns that we all used to chase. There are not as many to chase. Uh, there are many great exits to be had by companies that can scale but may not reach those heights. So I want to talk about venture capital. It is, everyone knows, the riskiest of the asset classes. Uh, here are all the asset classes that uh, you might know about, uh, private equity and venture in the middle. What you're looking at in the skinny little bars that, that stretch the most vertically, that's the dispersion of risk in that asset class. So if you look at venture capital, it's the riskiest because it has the tallest bar. It could deliver minus 25% IRR. It could deliver 80% IRR. Um, 
uh, pretty regularly. Uh, I've had funds across that spectrum in my career, uh, across the, the billions of dollars of AUM that, that we've managed. But the issue is that risk, right? Um, what you're looking at in the, in the dot in these asset classes is the median return. So to take that kind of risk, you get the same median return as you do for public stocks. You get about 10% return if you were to just, you know, sort of randomly pick a, a VC. Of course, every VC will say I'm better than the other, uh, but we all know that can't possibly be true because that's not how math works. <laughs> so uh, the yellow stripe is the 25th percentile, the gray stripe is the 75th percentile, but you take massive risk to get the dot that you see, which isn't really better than any other asset class as an investor in that space. So how do you deal with that? There's a couple of uh, you know statements people make, venture capital is inherently risky. I don't believe that's true. I believe it's risky as investors, VCs practice it today with small concentrated portfolios. I'm gonna show you that uh, in, in the data. You just say, well, we just pick better managers, right? No, doesn't work. Um, if your fund, if your previous fund was in the top half, you have a 50% chance of being in the top half next time. You have a 50% chance of being in the bottom half next time. If you were in the fourth quartile, if your fund was the worst performing 25%, you have a 50% chance of being in the top quartile next time. Uh, sorry, top half next time, and a 50% chance of being in the bottom half. It doesn't matter. Past performance has nothing to do with the, the future performance. Uh, the VCs that are out there building brands in many cases are just rolling the dice well two or three times in a row. That's why the phrase, hey, it takes 10 or 20 years to kill a VC is so popular in our industry. Um, so, you know, it, you can't you can't do it by manager selection and just put all your money with the best manager or the best couple of managers. How can you get more predictable returns with less risk? Well, uh, here's a, a magazine called Institutional Investor that shows you what I want to talk about. This isn't our data, this is their data. On the right, you see global equities. This is public companies. You get about a 10% median return, that's the diamond. But to get that 10% median return, the risk is that you'll get something like, I don't know, 5% to 12%. So to go get your 10%, your risk that you're taking is you're gonna land somewhere in the five to 12% zone. So if you invest over a long period of time, if you look at 15 uh, company portfolios in venture capital or venture studios that have 15 companies in them, it's going to look something like this, a 10%, very similar return. But the dispersion of risk is much higher. It could lose money. It could make 30%. That's why people are attracted to the venture asset classes to try to get those big returns. But it turns out, on average, you're going to land about where, where global equities land. But guess what? If you take the same random deals that are happening in the market. You know, just take, run a Monte Carlo simulation of 15 companies that looks like the left. If you run it with 500 companies, it looks like what's in the middle. The odds are you're gonna get more big winners. You're gonna hit those unicorns. You're gonna hit those bigger companies if you have 500 companies in a portfolio, not 15. So for an investor, uh, why take more risk to get what is really a lower return than having more companies in a portfolio actually seeing a higher median return because you're more likely to get lucky, right? And taking less risk because you're much more diversified. So that's the change that's happening in the venture industry. It's risky because of small, small portfolio sizes. So uh, we run this Monte Carlo simulation with our own data. Um, we've made, as you know, thousands of investments. We pick them at random. We run a million Monte Carlo simulations where we pick 400 at random. And what we get is a 20% net return, net IRR, uh, across those 400 at random on average. Uh, but we get pretty big risk, right? You could go from you know 5% to 60%, depending on which 400 companies you pick. You pick all the unicorns, you're way high, right? There's more than 20 of them in our portfolio. You pick all the losers, you're way low. Right, you're sort of at the 5%. Um, but if you pick 800 companies, your risk lowers and you get a little bit better return. That's a million simulations of our own companies that we've picked over the years. Uh, the more companies you put in, the more predictable the return and the lower the risk. It turns out this is the same phenomenon that every asset class has ever gone through. Um, if you look at this slide, that, that number on the right shows you what venture should look like if it was practiced more responsibly. If we didn't have people building small portfolios, not diversifying, 
uh, and being in more deals, it could look like what you see on the right in green and not like this crazy risky asset that we think it is. So Jack Bogle figured this out with public stocks. He built a company called Vanguard. You might have heard of it. He had the idea in 1951. Uh, in 1976, uh, the first index fund was launched uh, where it was low fee, be in, be in all the investments you can be in the space and take the returns the market is giving you. Pay low fee, be highly diversified and take the returns that are in the market versus trying to beat the market, which no one can do over time. In 2019, he died, unfortunately. But in 2022, he knew when he died. In 2022, index funds surpassed managed funds, more capital being put into index funds and public stocks than being put into managed funds, who managers were picking and choosing those stocks. This phenomenon happens in every asset class as it matures, and it will happen in venture as well. It just takes a long time. So what are the takeaways? Venture is like every other asset class. As you build your funds, as you think about investing in this type of asset, diversification matters a lot. Low fees matter a lot. Smart pricing, not overpaying matters a lot. Uh, and diversification does not have to come from aggregating many overly concentrated managers. Uh, that's how some people have tried to do it in the past. It's not inherently risky. It's only risky when you practice it for risk and you're really shooting for those crazy IRRs, you can deliver 20 to 30 net IRR, no problem in this space and destroy a public market comps over a long period of time if you think about things this way. So this is how VC will mature in my mind. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you. We've learned that through our own data and I'll give you the minute back, Max, that's all I got. So I, I put this unicorn mask because if you if you put this during someone who invested on pre-seed and 20 unicorns, there is a 100% chance that you will also invest on pre-seed uh, in the unicorns in the next 10 years. So the question uh, the question uh, about um, like you talked about numbers, but the question is about founders. Like what do uh, what do you look for in founders when you are investing in? Yeah, so we're looking for um, founders who have an intrinsic motivation, meaning it comes from inside them. They're not doing what they're doing because they did a spreadsheet and that spreadsheet, you know, fantasy.xls says that they're going to be really successful. Uh, they, they have an internal drive and a motivation. Of course, they have to be smart, you know, technical, uh, tech heavy founders in the beginning. And uh, we're really looking for that internal drive in a market that's it's a big, big change if it works in 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, another question, does the round size affect the VC uh, ROI, return on investment, in the long run? Uh, I don't know that the round size does. I think the pricing certainly does. Um, what we do is we, we're first check writers at the very earliest stages. Uh, we write a consistent check at a consistent valuation, and we do it many hundreds of times a year. I think if you're um, writing checks at, you know, you're trying to match some other VC or something and the round size is getting really big. Um, that's what leads to a lot of the, the well-known failures uh, in the space is people just chasing, you know, the deal that's the hot deal. Uh, my experience with the hot deal often doesn't work. Hmm. Uh, maybe can you share like uh, in the experience of uh, uh, tech stars, what is the final of those deals? Like you invest in 700, uh, on pre-seed, how many of them in percentage go to seed rounds and series sure. and so on? Yeah, so about 7 out of 10 uh, will raise after the accelerator program, so about 70%, and on average that's a million dollar raise, so, so it's sort of a first seed round. Um, and then of the 70% that raise, about a third of those will go on to raise a series A of 5 million or more. Uh, and then it tapers off from there. So what we've seen is about one in 80 uh, end up being a unicorn, right? So yeah, if you invest in 100 companies- One in 80. One in 80, one in 80 yeah. If you invest in 100 unicorns, um, I'm sorry, invest in 100 companies and you're a good investor, you're probably gonna hit one. If you invest in 30, probably not. Uh -huh. um, what are your thoughts on the role of venture studios in the ecosystem? I'm a big fan of Venture Studios. Um, we're early investors in Pioneer Square Labs and been involved with High Alpha and folks like that for a long time. Um, I think it's a great model. It's it's a leverage model where you're getting a lot of ownership for you know less less dollars. Uh, I would still pay attention to diversification. 
Uh, I know you're throwing a lot of stuff out, but the ones you do and you put in the market, again, if you're doing five or 10, it's a recipe for it not working. Um, I think angel investors learn that lesson over and over again. Uh, you need more investments. Um, so think about that as you construct your portfolio. Um, the last question is, uh, do you invest only in tech? Oh, like what is what is your sweet spot? Yeah, so we're software internet. Um, we, we do that in 16 countries and 55 cities where we have 100 investment professionals on the ground in those locations. So we do it all over the world, but it's very software internet focused. Yeah, super, super. David, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, Max. This is fun. Thanks for having me. I have to explain the spooky rules. Uh, some people who read my post on LinkedIn uh, read that uh, like I'm playing the one one hand with the, with my opponent here. You can see this is my opponent uh, and only one hand today. So if I win with uh, so and the scenario is that we all uh, went all in. So all in. Uh, my opponent also went all in. Uh, and we, we have one hand even before we, we saw our cards. So it's actually 50% chance to win and 50% chance to lose. So the game is I want to make, if I win, so I will weigh, make this Friday sweeter and I will eat a piece of cake. And I encourage everyone who wants to join, uh, to join uh, my hand. Uh, we'll also buy a cake today evening uh, and eat some, some cake. If I lose, I will restrict myself for sugar for one month, so no cookies, no cakes, no ice cream, uh, and everything containing sugar. Yeah, so, uh, and I have to show that uh, it is uh, random. I believe it's random. Uh, and yeah, we'll get, uh, we'll get two cards uh, and what are these cards? Jack and four. Oh, wow. It is bad. Probably it's less than 50% chance to win. Uh, but if you want to join me, so I forgot to say it, and you, you, you now have this opportunity to write all in if you want to join my challenge uh, in the chat. So put all in if you will risk to uh, not take sugar for one month uh, if my hand will lose. I want to invite Apura Mehta, our next speaker, a managing partner at Summit Peak Investments, a fund of funds. Uh, they uh, raised two funds. Uh, one of them invested in 11 um, venture funds and uh, fund, fund two invested in 19 venture funds. The, questions, uh, the question to everyone is, what do you think is, uh, how many underlying companies are under the fund two? So like, Fund of funds invest in 19 funds, uh, 18 funds, sorry. And those 18 funds invested in uh, more companies. So how many companies uh, are uh, in, in this fund, fund two? So, and uh, Apuro will answer this question and, uh, and start, uh, start uh, the speech on the topic of our learnings from being an LP in 30 venture funds. Sure, great. Thanks, Max. Thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen um, just a you know, quick overview uh, for for everyone on, on kind of who Summit Peak is. Um, my partner and I started our firm six years ago. Um, we spent our career on the endowment foundation side, so managing capital for uh, a children's hospital in Fort Worth, um, you know, multi-billion dollar endowment portfolio. And then prior to that, we both, you know, were at different endowments before that. So we took our years of experience allocating to funds um, building a venture program, you know, for the children's hospital and decided to you know, dedicate the next 30, 40 years of our career, you know, building an early stage venture fund of funds. Our approach, um, as Max said, you know, we, we invest in funds. Uh, it's about 70% of our portfolio. We're, we're managing three funds today, um, fund one, fund two, and fund three. Um, our first fund and all of our funds 60% of what we do, um, we're investing, you know, in what we call core managers. You know, those managers, um, you know, we have been backing for, you know, nearly a decade now. 
Um, you know, we, we on average will write a you know, seven million dollar check. They're they're oversubscribed. Um, you know, pre seed seed funds uh, on average they mature around a hundred million dollar fund size. Ten uh, percent of our portfolio are scout funds. Scouts are you know what we what we identify as the next generation of VCs. Um, you know, it could be as small as a ten million dollar fund, as large as a fifty million or even seventy five million dollar fund one. Um, you know, we take an active approach with our funds. We, we sit on the uh, LP advisory board, um, as well as just, you know, act as a true partner to the VCs that we work with. And then the last 30% of our portfolio, we're co-investing alongside of our GPs. So as they, you know, see the breakout companies and are participating, you know, generally around the series B, we're co-investing alongside of our GPs. Um, sorry, one second. Um, you know, as far as, where we're investing, um, you know, we're, we're ecosystem and network driven. A hundred percent of our, you know, investments are, are through network referrals. Um, you know, we're backing former founders. Um, you know, we, we believe operators make, you know, if, if they have an investing track record, they can make great VCs. Um, and then we're, you know, we're backing, uh, people that are, are, are spinning out of brand name firms. Um, I'll, uh, save you from reading the legal disclaimer and, and kind of, you know, answer the question that Max asked, which is, you know, what do we look for in funds? Um, and after having done it at Summit Peak, um, you know, over 30 funds and then, you know, a prior decade before that, you know, as an investor, you know, GP business model fit really, you know, really matters to us. Um, your fund size really dictates your strategy. Um, and it's not just about, you know, having a thesis, it's, you know, portfolio construction model ownership. Um, but the three, you know, key areas that we think about are, you know, sourcing, picking and winning, um, you know, and to, to, to be a true outlier VC, you know, we believe, you know, you should have at least two out of three of those, you know, sourcing and sourcing, picking and winning. Um, so when we think about investing in any fund, you know, we're looking at those three components. Um, you know, what's a GP sourcing ability or, are, you know, are they seeing deals that fit within their business model um, that they're executing on? Um, you know, as it relates to picking, you know, do they have some acumen? What's their network? Um, you know, how are they diligencing those founders? Um, so what's their acumen in picking? And then, you know, third, um, on winning, you know, what's their ability to win um, in an overly crowded, you know, venture market as we've seen grow, you know, massively over the last 10 years? Um, you know, do they have a proven ability to win? Are they getting into really interesting deals, you know, that might have been either oversubscribed or hard to get into? Are they getting it into those companies, you know, before there's even a round? Um, you know, are they able to do the pro rata in the next round because they added some value? Um, and, and we're really looking at, you know, does, does a GP have some asymmetric edge on, you know, at least two or two or three of those, you know, sourcing, picking and winning. Um, you know, we think a lot about a first close um, of a fund, you know, the first close should optimize, you know, a minimum viable fund for, you know, for somebody to execute on the strategy that, you know, they're trying to execute against, um, whether that's, you know, ownership, number of companies, the types of companies, the stages, um, you know, and that that may or may not include result, uh, reserves. Um, and then last but not least, and, you know, I think David talks a little bit about this, but, um, you know, past past performance is certainly not indicative of future results. And so we we think a lot about process, um, you know, processes is, you know, in our minds, you know, greater than than results. And, and you know, we we don't hold a lot of value to past performance. Um, you know, we're, we're making a decision in that fund again, every time we back them, um, you know, believing it on whether we think that they'll be able to execute on that strategy. So, um, you know, those are some of the key learnings of, you know, after having done this for, you know, over a decade in terms of what we're looking for in funds, um, you know, and the last, you know, maybe thing I'll add, um, there's a lot of funds out there, new funds out there, um, you know, rely, rely heavily on your networks, um, you know, as an allocator, um, you know, we, we see a lot, um, a lot of deal flow from a lot of different sources, um, you know, LinkedIn, old emails, et cetera, um, our own website, um, you know, leverage your network to be able to, you know, 
make you know make make yourself stand out to to the top of our pile um find a way in other than you know a generic source um or you know cold reach out it's just you know as an allocator we we see and we just focus on venture if you're you know if you're targeting a family office or an endowment they have all these other asset classes and so they're you know i might receive 20 emails a day or 30 emails a day um you know if i'm allocating across a multiple asset classes, you know, multiply that times the number of asset classes. So finding a way into an investor's inbox, you know, through your network is, is the, you know, is the easiest way that, you know, you'll be able to get the time and attention of that allocator. So I'll, I'll pause there. Max. Super, super. Yeah. Um, one question is, um, how was your past work experience contributed to your ability to choose successful investments? probably successful funds or companies you invest in? Yeah, um, I mean, when we started our venture program a decade ago for the Children's Hospital, you know, the micro VC segment was nascent. I mean, there was 150 to 200 quasi-institutional funds in, in the marketplace. And so we had, you know, a front row seat of this asset class grow to what it is today, where, you know, now there's over 3,000 funds, that, you know, that, that look like that. Um, so it, you know, the the success has been leveraging our network. You know, we've built a massive network of funds and founders and and LPs, and um, you know, we leverage that from a diligence perspective. Um, you know, beyond what we think about, you know, these three key areas of you know sourcing, picking, and winning, understanding process. You know, we we leverage what founders think, um, and and really trying to find that discernible edge of, you know, how a fund is going to be able to, you know, back the next outlier companies. Um, so, you know, the, I would say our, our experience and our ability to pick a new fund today is, you know, cumulative result of, you know, being in the space over the last, you know, decade plus. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my question is, um, when you invest in funds, so there are double commissions for limited partners, and how do you uh, uh, usually manage it? Um, so are the, these commissions like 220 smaller, or how does it work in, in case of uh, the fund? No, funds? I mean, so we, we, we don't, you know, we're not trying to create a misalignment of incentives. I mean, you know, a, a small fund has has a fee structure that's appropriate for, for a small fund. Um, and so, you know, we, we realize that the two is going to, you know, keep the lights on of a firm and, and they're really working for the 20 on the back end. Um, you know, as a fund of funds, you know, the, the, the negative for us is it's fees on fees. Um, but our hybrid business model, which, you know, 30% of our portfolio is direct investments it allows us to kind of mitigate our own fee structure. So, you know, we're bringing down the weighted average cost. You know, we we buy into what, you know, David from Techstars just said, um, you know, our fund too had, has a thousand companies in the portfolio. Um, so, you know, it, it plays into that, you know, the idea of Monte Carlo simulation and it gives us, you know, the most shots on goal to be able to achieve, you know, power law outcomes. Our fund one today has 544 companies um, you know, 100 companies, so 10% of the portfolio is driving, you know, 90% of our fair market value in our fund one. So our fund emulates, you know, kind of what the power law should look like for, you know, for a venture program. And the co-investment piece of the portfolio, you know, mitigates, you know, the double layer of fees. Mm-hmm. Um, um, the question, uh, have you invested in venture studios? venture builders, or if not, would you? And if yes, what criteria you look for? We, we haven't um, invested in venture studios. I mean, we, when we started our you know venture effort a decade ago, we were really focusing on the micro VC space, solo GPs. Um, we, you know, I would say, you know, of the 18 funds in our portfolio, the majority are solo VCs that might graduate into multiple partners over time. Um, you know, there's a lot of variables to underwrite as it is. And, um, you know, we found that backing a solo GP was just one less variable as opposed to underwriting multiple partners and who's bringing what value um, and is that value sustainable over time. So, we, you know, we have done some stuff focused around incubators like Y Combinator, uh, but for the most part, you know, focused on solo GPs and small funds. And we, you know, we really believe in this small fund math. 
Mm -hmm. So like small funds uh, may return, may, may give better returns uh, because like a uh, new manager is uh, focusing all her uh, efforts to use this money as much effectively as possible is, is, is the logic behind. Yeah, I mean, um, there's recycling, you know, there's just, there's it, small funds, the, the math and the returns and, you know, there's Cambridge data that shows, you know, developing managers have outperformed, uh, sorry, yeah, developing managers have outperformed established managers. It's, you know, it's because of the fund size math. I mean, the return, the fund math on a 20 to $100 million fund, um, even more appropriate in the environment that we're in today where, you know, new unicorn creation has gone, you know, drop uh, dramatically and will it'll, it'll once again become a novel concept to have a billion dollar outcome. And so a small fund, not every outcome or not every exit needs to be a billion dollars to, you know, to put DPI or, you know, returns back in investors' pockets. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Apuro. Uh, thank you for your uh, experience on uh, managing fund of funds. Um, thank you. Thanks, are, uh, Before I start my presentation about Venture Studios, um, I want to, to ask you to put in the chat to answer the question, like, what was your the most unusual hobby? So, because uh, I want to share my story. Uh, this summer, 2023, uh, I took a challenge uh, to meet 100 people on the streets. So every morning I went to, and this was actually my hobby for 100 days. So every morning I went to run uh, on the seafront and then um, I came up to some random people, strangers, and asked like, uh, do you know, do you speak English? If people said yes, uh, I continued. Uh, I have a morning practice of meeting new people every day. If you have five min minutes to talk, I would like to meet you. Uh, and uh, if people said yes, uh, we talk to five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes or more. And uh, at the end of our conversation, I asked, like, let's do a selfie together. If somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, during this script, uh, a person said no, I don't want to, I, I don't know English, uh, I don't know, I don't want to talk to you, or I don't want to make a selfie. So I went to the next person and collected some statistics. So I, ha I have statistics on LinkedIn in one of the posts, uh, so that I approached more than 200 people and actually collected 100 photos. And you can see, I printed all this uh, 100 photos uh, in different places where I traveled, uh, and mo mo most of them are in Portugal, where I live. I'm waiting for your strange hobby or some unexpected hobby. Let's continue our poker game. So you remember my cards, not very good. I would also not, not go all in with, with these cards, but today are su such rules. And we are opening the flop. Uh, Nothing good for us, unfortunately. We have some prizes, and if you want to get some prizes, some books, uh, you have to participate uh, in our next activity, which is the VC Hacks contribution session. You will have three minutes. You will have the form to put one your VC hack on one of the topics. So that there are three topics you can choose from. Fundraising for VC funds. So how to uh, how to close uh, limited partners, how to source limited partners, and how to fundraise uh, in your fund. So this is topic number one. If you have some hacks or some tricks on how to do this, you, you can share it. The topic number two is deal flow creation. So how to source uh, best deals, how to set partnerships in order to not to miss uh, great deals on the market. And this is number two. The topic number three is investment decision making on uh, how to make better decisions to deliver higher returns. Three minutes uh, finished. So uh, send please this forum. You will get the copy to your email, and later after the conference, we'll uh, we'll uh, gather all the field forms, and we will uh, share it with all the participants who contributed their hacks and all who reposted the announcement. Also, we have someone additional form 
for general partners and all people involved in venture capital funds. So if you're part of a VC fund, uh, we plan to organize some uh, meetings to share experience because we have our uh, community of venture studios and uh, we want to make some additional exchange because studios also raise their own funds. And uh, if you want to uh, access some some closed meetings for general partners and uh, partners of uh, VC funds, so please um, uh, fill, fill the form. So one minute to, to fill the form, very simple form uh, with a couple of questions. And uh, later in February or March, we will get back to you. And uh, when we will organize those meetings, we will invite you to join and share all pains and uh, success stories and uh, uh, numbers uh, which uh, which uh, general partners and uh, VC fund managers have. Yeah, so uh, this is and this is about about the uh, form. You can see it in the chat also. Uh, please feel if you are a GP or you are involved in managing a fund. Now, my my topic is about venture studios. Um, so criticism and excitement uh, of venture studios. For those who don't know, uh, venture studios are organizations that create several companies uh, each year. They partner with entrepreneurs. Uh, they partner with um, those uh, founders with or without ideas because usually they have their own process of idea generation, validation, and they uh, they are involved for one, two years to build several companies a year. So most studios during their first years, they build uh, between three and five companies a year. But uh, after, if they progress, they can build 10 companies or 15 companies each year. Uh, they also invest their own capital, usually uh, on pre-seed uh, or sometimes seed. Uh, and their team of uh, 10 or 20 uh, professionals, they help to uh, reach revenue faster for the startups and to uh, get external funding um, for, for, for the startups. So if you compare uh, this startup studio model to other VC stakeholders, uh, VC funds, uh, incubators and accelerators, you'll find that uh, startup studios are most involved uh, in building in building companies. So they're not just supporting, they're not just investing. Uh, they can say that we are co-founding companies. Uh, uh, this is the difference between startup studios and uh, accelerators and. Uh, and, um, and then. Uh, because they involved, they are very much involved in the process of building companies. Uh, they take more equity. So usually it is like from 20 to 40 percent, sometimes even 50 percent or 80 percent. But most cases it's like 30, 35 percent or 20 and 25 percent. Uh, and studios are growing very fast. Of course, not as successful. Uh, studios also die, uh, but the trajectory is uh, is. Um, growing so they doubled in, in number during the last five years uh, and still it is uh, most investors don't understand what is what, what is a venture studio uh, and uh, because of this and because there are many different and difficult models of studios um, there are problems uh, and critics of this model. And I outline uh, all the critics in my research. So it is uh, big research on studios with uh, uh, more than 100 sources. Uh, and uh, there are actually eight problems. Here I present only three the biggest problems. So the first is attracting experienced founders. So why would uh, a founder with previous exit or just a second time founder give up, let's say 25 or 40% equity uh, if they can uh, fundraise, if they can raise capital from VCs. So this is the problem number one, attracting experienced founders. Uh, not all studios have this problem and some studios uh, cope with this problem very well and attract existed founders. 
uh, but this is probably a number one problem. The other problem uh, are cap table problems. So if um, studio takes, let's say, 35% equity, uh, the next VCs on the seed or on Series A and later, they will uh, not ready to invest. So this will be a red flag for them that uh, some company, maybe passive investor has a big chunk of equity in the startup. So uh, studios also, uh, startups coming of studios also face these problems. Not all of them, but uh, one of the popular problems. And the third is it's very difficult to fundraise in studios. Mostly you rely on your existing network. Uh, probably as with the uh, venture capital funds, uh, that you are rely on your existing network and uh, you fundraise uh, in your holding company or the fund. And it might be difficult to explain to uh, investors who are first time meeting this uh, venture studio model, uh, how it uh, operates and uh, in, what, in what I invest. I invest in, in the studio, I invest in startups, uh, and uh, it might be difficult to, to explain. So these are problems. The advantages are faster traction. So uh, because of, uh, studios usually have their own funds uh, and they invest on pre-seed or seed, um, and because uh, they uh, accumulate expertise, so it's much easier to build uh, your 10th or 15th startup than the first one in agri-tech or in fintech because you already accumulated your uh, partnerships, customers, you understand this field very well. Uh, and uh, this is why you are, you are having faster traction and your startups get revenue faster, your startups uh, get um, fundraising rounds faster uh, and exit faster also. So in my research, here I show some, uh, some statistics. And also, um, the existing statistics show that studios have higher returns. I will not mention those figures because they are too, uh, too optimistic, I believe, and we plan to uh, create our own uh, scientific research on this topic this year. Uh, but uh, most studios I talk to, they show very big IRRs. Uh, successful studio, of course, it is not the case of each studio, but uh, top quartile studios, they show very good numbers in terms of TVPI, IRRs, or DPIs. Um, and um, yeah, this I will not show, uh, but I will show the, um, this is statistics of uh, just usual startup founders. Um, pretty old, maybe from 2013, uh, when um, there was comparison of exit rates for founders that are like first time founder, previous companies founded zero, so uh, exit rate 5%. And uh, those who, who are launching their fourth or fifth company uh, or more, they have like 10% plus um, exit rate. Maybe uh, this is the reason that many VCs try to focus on uh, second time founders, those who already launched uh, previous companies. And um, in, in terms of venture studio, I consider it as a co-founder with uh, maybe 10, maybe 20 companies launched, uh, especially if in the specific field, it, it gives uh, big, big advantages in terms of launching new companies because you have uh, accumulated expertise. Uh, and uh, there is statistics showing that um, it is more efficient if you have previous experience in something than uh, doing it the first time. So I want to show one example. Uh, a studio I like is uh, OSS Ventures in France. They are a uh, four years old studio building B2B SaaS startups for manufacturing operations and factories. And uh, their case is very niche focused. So they visit factories. They visited factories 860 times, collected hundreds of pain points and understand this industry very well. In 12 months, their startups uh, get to half a million ARR uh, and uh, eight or 15 companies got Series A funding during those four years. Uh, they launched uh, 15 startups, probably now a bit more, and uh, their uh, portfolio ARR is uh, 25 million euro. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the question I want to ask you, um, maybe most studios already know the answer, like how many applications from founders uh, do they get? 
Uh, if you want to share this guess in the chat, uh, please please share. But I will give you the right answer, and it is eight thousand eight thousand uh, applications a year they get from uh, from founders willing to join the studio. And why I love this case because the studio sharing numbers in public. And uh, and they also share their numbers to founders. So this is the reason founders see that their companies succeed, and they want to join uh, join their companies. What's interesting that sixty uh, percent of founders uh, co-founding their startups. So for each startup, they attract a CEO and a CTO. Uh, the studio gets 25% equity and the founders get 75%, uh, uh, 37.5% uh, each. And 60% um, of their founders had previous exits. So founders build build the company, sold company and joined the studio because founders understand that with this studio, I can uh, earn more money at exit uh, and I can move faster, get to revenue faster because uh, they are understanding their field better than any other VC firm, better than any other uh, studio in this field. And this is the uh, my vision of what, how uh, studios uh, should build their strategy. So they should be niche focused in order to claim that we are the best at building such startups at this niche in this industry and uh, in this geography. Uh, yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Um, most studios know, and I want to uh, tell that we have the paid community for venture studios called the Venture Studio Family, uh, where studios uh, meet twice a month, uh, share numbers inside. So you, you might understand what are benchmarks in terms of taking equity from uh, uh, in each startup, investing in startup, paying salaries to entrepreneurs and residents and so on, and uh, asking different questions and sharing experience. And also in January, we'll have uh, exchange of documents and playbooks. So each studio can ask for, uh, we need, for example, a founder studio agreement, or we want to see some decks of studios that fundraise so you are, you can ask this uh, document and we will collect in our uh, in this community and we'll share those documents and also in march we'll have some uh, event for investors uh, where investors understanding the studio model will meet studios in our community uh, and there will be some type of a demo day for studios when uh, you can present your studio so this is what we are doing in the uh, community the next meeting is January 23rd uh, with the topic of revenue sources for studios. So there are different types of uh, sources like charging your startups for your services or investments uh, um, uh, or maybe some services uh, to, to other companies. Um, so and we will discuss like how to make a studio independent during the community. Uh, I want to open the next card. So you can see, you can see here, we have uh, not very good position, but maybe, maybe the next card will help us. Uh, actually, if we get nine later, we'll we'll have straight here with Jack. Um, yeah, but I want to I want to tell you that uh, because it is a VC online conference. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know how a VC online conference could be without the skin in the game. This is why I add some additional uh, challenge for me, which is if I lose with this card, um, my face will face the scale. So I will have my skin on the game, my skin of my face in the game. But it will be after all the speakers, so that. Uh, so that only people who are ready to, to some uh, cringe content will will live, uh, will will be here. Okay, uh, so I want to invite our uh, moderator, Clancy Star, a managing partner at uh, Go Ahead Ventures, Silicon Valley based fund with 180 million assets uh, under management. Uh, please, Clancy. Hi guys, nice to meet you. Um, I didn't realize there were going to be so many of you here. Uh, Max asked me to do this on, I think, last week. 
Um, but yeah, I'm happy to help out here. Like Mike said, um, I manage Go Ahead Ventures with my two best friends from Stanford. Um, it's kind of like our startup in a way. Um, we started nine years ago, um, my junior year at Stanford. And it was kind of just like a, almost like a student project. We were just managing $5 million for some Stanford alumni. And bit by bit, we just kind of grew it to go ahead. Like Matt said, we have 180 million in committed capital under management. Um, and we're on our third fund. Uh, but it's still just me, my two best friends. It's a very chill operation. But yeah, that's it on me. Uh, Matt, should I just go ahead and introduce the next set of speakers here? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Okay, cool. So we're just a few minutes behind schedule, so I'm going to shorten these intros a little bit, so hopefully no one will be offended by that. Um, this next discussion is about artificial intelligence and how it's changing everything about venture capital, including you know raising money. Um, the speakers are going to be Margot Wu, who is the lead artificial intelligence investor at Georgian, um, which has more than $6 billion in management. And Jason Brenier, uh, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Reverie Ventures, um, and also heads up their AI investments. Um, so go for it, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, well, excited to be here. Uh, and an interesting topic because our industry is undergoing massive change. Uh, right now, there are more demanding requirements for fund managers, tighter controls on capital, uh, things will likely continue to be the same in 2024. And this is being driven by, you know, a confluence of multiple factors happening in the macro economy, as we all know. But uh, Jason and I think there is one factor that is critical to being the best GP you can be right now. Uh, and consequently, your ability to raise um, is also dependent on this factor, and that is uh, essentially AI. So today we're going to quickly share some observations from our journey through this gauntlet that we hope will help you in your own fundraising and investing efforts. Uh, and we'll quickly tell you a little bit about us and why we have a perspective uh, on AI and investing in AI and fundraising. Uh, you know, as mentioned, I'm a lead investor at Georgian. We are growth stage investors in companies that are leveraging applied AI and have been for 10 plus years. Uh, we write checks of 25 to 50 million in B2B software companies. And what makes us really different is that we actually have an internal R&D team made up of 30 plus data scientists, data engineers, uh, ML engineers, and um, product managers that help our portfolio accelerate their AI roadmaps. Uh, and we do this in a few ways from ad hoc advisory across the portfolio to uh, deep well scoped research engagements uh, on some of the, the biggest uh, AI technical challenges that could help inflect a company's top line or help with efficiency down the tech stack. And perhaps one of the most popular ways that companies have engaged with us over the last few years has been one to two week hackathons where we bring a group from our team uh, to experiment on three or four different approaches to creating something of like an MVP or POC that is close to production ready. And I'll let Jason take it away, but he used to be on our team at Georgian as well and, and has a good perspective. Yeah, formerly at Georgian, built the platform that did a lot of things that Margaret just shared and uh, currently launching a studio this year, Reverie Ventures. It's focused on creating 10 to 15 Gen AI companies over the next three years. And we're applying a very similar approach, but this time uh, to an earlier part of the process the venture creation process. So uh, automatically generating and qualifying some of the ideas, doing market validation, uh, using a virtual panel of experts uh, to critique some of those startup ideas, uh, using AI to prototype and also to accelerate some of the startups uh, once they get to that stage. Uh, so this was the team at, at Georgian, but I just want to say, um, don't be alarmed if you don't have 30 people within your fund. There, there's still an opportunity, we believe, to bring AI into the conversation as your fund fundraising. I think there's 
uh, a lot to be done, even with just power power users of ChatGPT and the right mindset uh, to set your strategy, um, become, as Marcus said earlier, the best GP that you poss- possibly can be, um, and uh, build a partnership with uh, with the right LPs. Uh, at Georgian, we uh, leveraged our our investment theses to create a framework. Uh, which is in, in essence a maturity uh, a maturity model for uh, two purposes. Number one, it was to help uh, our investment team understand what the opportunities uh, out there were and kind of evaluate those 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 opportunities. But secondly, it was to help founders understand kind of where they were on their um, adoption journey of uh, AI, so that we could partner with them to accelerate the business. I think. This framework applies equally to uh, anybody who's fundraising out there, um, any GP, any VC, any studio uh, that is trying to adopt AI into their uh, operations as well. So what do LPs care about? Well, I joined Georgian during our fund three. We are now investing out of fund six. Our fund size grew from 375 million to 900 plus, and we now have 6.5 five billion assets under management. Uh, and the answer to this question has evolved. Uh, in our experience, besides performance and DPI, which are top, top of, of mind, of course, uh, there is an opportunity as a fund manager to help LPs understand tech trends, uh, how they might apply to their own business operations and workflows as LPs, and how that thought leadership might create opportunities to access the best deals with companies that are leveraging uh, AI. Uh, so really, there's we think ultimately we have found that they want a trusted partner that they can rely on to identify these trends. Uh, whether it's AI or, or something else, but right now it's all about generative AI uh, and and really be a leader in predicting what impact that might have on the entire ecosystem. So looking for trusted partner, that's, uh, especially when it comes to the new latest and greatest tech. And why is AI, why does AI offer a particularly special opportunity to do all those things that Margaret just mentioned? Well, because of the nature of AI, it helps uh, bring efficiency to workflows. It brings data into decisions. Uh, it transforms kind of the um, day-to-day operations of, uh, of any team. And these are things that we all as investors, as GPs, as folks involved in studios do every single day. Um, And so being able to do that uh, and experiment with that kind of positions you uh, to become that trusted partner that Margot mentioned, you're going to gain the skill of uh, selecting the tools that might work or not work. You're going to be able to speak from that experience um, and kind of bring your LPs or your investors along for the ride. So where do you begin with all of that? Uh, I mentioned, you know, you don't have to have that 30 person team. We recommend just starting uh, with what your superpowers are. What do you do best? Is it sourcing? Is it uh, market validation? Uh, Is it building uh, strong relationships with founders or community? AI can apply to all of these really critical steps in the whole investment process. And that's uh, that's what we did at Georgian. Um, we were great at sourcing. We we're great at M&A or helping our companies with M&A um, and uh, making introductions to sales teams for the companies within the portfolio. But over time, we began to use uh, off the shelf tools and third party uh, software and data to begin to augment those processes. And eventually uh, we were able to build a lot of the infrastructure and models to apply to these things uh, in house. So it's a journey, but start where you're awesome and apply the superpower of AI to your superpowers. Right, and I I mean, Maybe I'll, I'll just pause there for a second, Jason. It was all about finding out where are our biggest bottlenecks or points where human efficiency or human capability was almost impossible to tackle 
uh, on our own. So how, you know, we're growth stage investors. How can we scan and be on top of 80,000 active startups at one time? It was naturally a machine learning problem. But once we figured out how to deal with our data pipeline and apply that machine learning problem, we saw that we were able to take the same chassis of technology that we had uh, applied to sourcing and then use that and apply it to essentially finding M&A targets for our existing portfolio uh, or create the outreach uh, pipeline for, for sourcing and bringing efficiency to outreach as well. Okay, sorry, Jason, next one. Um, so, you know, on the fundraising side, we talked about how we, we felt thought leadership was really important during our, all of our processes. Um, LPs want to be better informed uh, direct investors or co-investors and they they want to be able to build differentiation in their own ecosystem and adopt these technologies in their own businesses this can come in the form of uh, very financially driven lps who are huge asset managers and have to run their organization um, to uh corporate lps that usually have an innovation team or an enterprise that it needs to understand their tech stack needs as well um, we thought it would be, you know, we just talked about some of the examples that, uh, of how we've uh, tried to create thought leadership during our fundraising processes. Um, at Georgian, that has meant, especially in the last year, um, creating Gen AI workshops, both at a one-to-one -one advisory level, where we would essentially treat our LPs as as our portfolio companies, uh, hearing what some of the, their needs are, telling them what we're seeing across other companies, uh, what evolution of the new tech stack uh, we're seeing is going to be required at the enterprise or SMB level, uh, and um, even getting hands on and having you know LPs into the office or us going on site to them and showing them how they can build their personal GPs uh, for their day to day. Uh, anywhere from processing data rooms of GPs uh, all the way to you know creating your own analyst bot that quickly uh, quickly goes through uh, uh, various PDF documents or, or PowerPoint documents put forward uh, you know, during their diligence process. We're, and we're also telling them about the latest and greatest tooling being sold to uh, asset managers using generative AI that were uh, bringing productivity uh, across our LP base. So we're treating our I'll LPs just, like our portfolio companies. I'll just say, I think we have just a few seconds left. I'll just share yeah, one other sorry. example on the access to the best deals, uh, which is one of the other things that Margo uh, mentioned earlier at Reverie. Um, uh, we have uh, two computational linguists on the on the founding team uh, that have backgrounds in doing research on uh, social interaction and conversation analysis. Uh, we also have a, a trained coach and psychotherapist. We've applied all of these to create uh, an AI platform that gives feedback to founders um, on their pitches. This has gotten us uh, great credibility with those um, with those founding teams, and also provides really useful insights for um, making the fundraising process uh, much more uh, successful. Um, As an example, okay, cool. uh, yeah, I'm sorry, to, sorry to cut you guys short. Um, we we have a few questions here, and I think one question that came up at least three times here was. Um, you know, what are some resources or tools that you would recommend for someone trying to implement AI in their fund, either for fundraising or portfolio selection or management? Um, you know, obviously a lot of these people here have smaller teams and so they don't have five engineers on site who can just build something completely custom from scratch. Uh, what are some off the shelf tools, if any, that you're aware of that, that um, are helpful? Yeah, lots out there. In fact, it's a rapidly expanding set of third-party to tools that are available. Um, you can just start with uh, something like Affinity or Power Searches within PitchBook. Um, you can actually get a lot of uh, leverage out of that. There's some amazing GPTs that are out there that can help with filtering um, some of the uh, the deals or, or company information that's out there, gathering information about uh, companies. So I think you can very much get 
a long way just by being again a power user of some of some of the tools that um, that are easily obtainable, and that takes zero machine like in house machine learning experts. Uh, it's quickly evolving. I, if you do a simple uh, Google search, what's fascinating is how many VCs or people trying to put together their own GP, GPT then aren't afraid to share it. Uh, so whether it's a, you know a bot that automatically does a market a quick market research report on any company uh, to um, you know managing your CRM or whatnot, Google or the GPT art like the GPT uh, archives are a great place to start. I think for us to go ahead, um, you know, the biggest challenge has been the data. We've actually found that, like you guys have said, the algorithms are not so hard to find. You can even ask ChatGPT, what would you do to analyze this data? I think for us, the hardest thing has been, you know, how do you take public facing or paid private data um, and commingle it with your own internal data? What are you guys finding? internally like data that you're collecting internally that you're training on um and then what's some data externally that you're you're finding is pretty high quality or, or rich for training on build build Jason, a graph I don't know if you want <laughs> yeah I would, I would say like bring bring together as many different sources as uh as you can graph models have been incredibly um useful just because of you know, a lot of what we do is still very much relationship based and proximity based. And there's a lot of uh, research papers out there um, that have done massive studies that have found um, that, that there's high correlation um, based on graph morphology. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but yeah, internal data sources like observe instrument what your investment team is doing or not doing. Um, and feed that and marry that with, uh, you know, the data that you can get from lots of different vendors out there. There's been an explosion of different um, data vendors. Scrape, scrape websites of the company, scrape uh, social media, scrape, 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 because there's really, really great information that's out there as well, but you got to go out and find it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a combination of third party data providers, internal data and, um, collecting, uh, outside data yourself. It did require an investment in having either contract or internal R and D resources to do that. Uh, and you have to make the conscious decision that you, you do believe a data driven approach is going to bring you scale and efficiency. You're going to have to make that trade off. Georgian didn't make that decision until we were a fund three GP and knew we were going to reach the scale where we could make that type of investment. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is, you know, if you don't have a lot of team members or internal resources, I would say just make sure you're not throwing away your own data. You know, after you meet a founder, record your own rating on various factors and make your own predictions and see how you're performing. I mean, one of the things we have tracked internally is how good are we at predicting whether someone will get a series A and measuring that over time and then trying to train models on ourselves to see if we can get the model to match our own predictions and also just see how accurate um, it is as well. So don't, don't kind of discount your own data that you can generate just from your own insights and thinking and, and meeting notes. Um, okay, I think we kind of have to move on to our next um, panel here, but thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Okay, cool. I'll just hop right into to introducing um, some of the people that I can, I can see. Uh, yeah, so ben, ben is a founding partner um, at Chasing Rainbows, uh, 40 under, under 40 for venture capital, um, all sorts of other stuff too. Um, Jenny here is co-founder managing partner at Everywhere Adventures, invested in more than 300 companies, um, huge community, more than 500 people in her community of operators, founders, etc. cetera. Um, Mark is the chief strategy officer at TSX Entertainment, um, and he helps them build AI tools and markets. Um, he's also an LP and a few funds, um, and Stephanie, is co-founder CEO at Diet and Capital, um, also an LP and a few funds. Um, and yeah, we're gonna kind of just do a bit of a panel here. Um, and 
I'm going to ask a few questions here. We have three questions. Really doesn't allow a lot of time for everyone's answers. So let's try to answer these questions in 30 to 40 seconds each. Um, and we'll see how we do. Um, so first question here, and we'll start with Ben, is you know how do LPs evaluate fund managers? I think given the time constraint, everyone should probably just choose their, if they can only do one thing to evaluate a fund manager, what would you do? Um, and we'll start with that. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably, maybe we'll throw this actually to one of the LPs instead. I think that would be a better use of time. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, also a GP, but... Oh, also purely GP. Okay, so, meet so our Mark. LPs in the room are Stephanie and Mark. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. um, Stephanie, uh, would you like... Meeting everybody. I love the panel so far. Um, nice to see you again, Ben. Um, well, so in essence, a lot has been mentioned already. And I think it comes down to really five things. So obviously GP team experience, then what's their sector focus regions, like traction performance, big one, tough for emerging managers, right? Where you're like trying to raise for your fund one. Um, but then it's the traction of before or performance or like um, Ihar said before, he talked about how he did angel investments and what track record he had there. And then one thing that I think nobody mentioned yet that's very important to me is what are like the capabilities of the GPs? Like how big is the team to actually sit on boards? So when you think of like the Tigers and Sequoias that invest in like hundreds of companies, there's no way the investment team actually can give them the, enough love, right? Because they can't sit on all these boards and then still work on deal sourcing and actually working through their pipeline. So that's like a really important aspect that I think hasn't been mentioned enough. And that's how I pick a lot of the VCs that are on our platform. So I run a deal flow platform for VCs we have 850 VCs on the platform. We specifically look for VCs that actually are hands-on, that give their portfolios time and help them, you know, with HR, product, GTM, like all the things that you need. And Mark, we'll turn this over to you as well. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, ultimately, I, I, I think there's a few things. I think the reputation of the, of the fund manager, among other fund managers, is actually sort of important uh, because they're able to attract interest from the parties and things like that. I, I've also, you know, this is in, in addition to what she said already, uh, I've also found that some of the more successful ones that I've worked with in the past uh, have had um, sort of a maniacal uh, focus on getting to know and cultivating relationships with strong uh, technical entrepreneurs across the industry because they having that human talent having that access to human talent they tend to hear about all the interesting deals they get first access to the interesting things that are happening uh, and i guess the last thing is really you know what as they noted before the space is pretty crowded so how are funds different differentiating themselves they have a story or they just kind of spraying praying like everybody else but <clears throat> And I've actually had a lot of opportunity to do it. So my, the most interesting thing I did recently was is not TSX, but I, I'm the co-founder of Clover, the point of the sale system. It's now slightly larger than Square. So, but awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, I guess I'll turn one question over to the GPs here. Um, the question is kind of, you know, how have you been able to attract um, LP so far? Maybe you know, talk a little bit about how you found your anchor or something like that. Um, I'll let Jenny go first here. Yeah, happy to happy to start. Um, so like many people kind of bootstrapped my fund. So I had a kind of full time job working in another fund as I started this fund nights and weekends. So I was able to kind of build a track record. So I think that kind of went a long way when I finally went full time. But then something that um, someone else said about the team. So my co-founder and I worked together um, part time on our fund. So we were both kind of part time for a few years. And now we've been working together for five years, five and a half years. Uh, we've known each other for longer than that. And we've invested in a few hundred companies together. So I think like the strongest differentiator when we went to market, we could talk about our strategy, we could talk about all these things, but just the fact that we'd worked together and invested together for all those years, I think was, was super critical. So um, I guess my piece of advice is, you know, even if you're just kind of starting out, like do a bunch of angel deals or, um, you know, uh, warehouse some deals with someone, because I think that'll go a long way with the LPs. It seemed to be the thing that every LP like that we talked to, it was the first thing they mentioned was like, wow, you guys have like done a lot together. 
And that, that's I love that you said that, Jenny. Um, yeah, Patrick and I, my other general partner, our fund, we actually worked at start out uh, a volunteer in a volunteer perspective for five years together before start before he joined the fund. And so I completely agree. I think that that relationship is so important. Um, you know, in terms of how we went about it, like uh, in terms of like finding the anchor and things like that. So we we just started raising our fund at the beginning of January of 2023. Uh, we did our first close in uh, in September of that year. So like you know, and we actually went about going after um, high net worth individuals to actually get to our first million to be able to do our first close. And we have a $10 million fund. And then we, after we did our first close, that's when we uh, had lots of institutional investors come to us and say, okay, great, now let's actually start diligencing, diligencing you properly. And so I think that that really helped us get to our anchor, which we closed um, at the last week of December, actually. So we just, uh, so you know, we're ahead of schedule in terms of where we were to be, which is awesome. And, you know, now we've soft served with the last $4 million of the fund as well. So, like, it's amazing it all sort of came together at once just after getting first close. So, I think that was a really big step for us. And, you know, I think the other thing that I would say around our strategy was really understanding the networks that you are in as well. And so, like, we're an LGBTQ plus focus fund. And so, both being part of the plus community ourselves has been really helpful for us to actually focus on trying to find investors who care about that. Um, and ensuring that diversity is uh, is a really big key. And so that kind of helped us get to the point where we took smaller checks as well. So we're really strategizing around. So in the US, if you have a fund that's 10 million or less, you can have 249. Um, uh, accredited investors rather than 99 after you get above 10, 10 million, which doesn't quite make sense from a numbers perspective, but <laughs> it does mean that you can take smaller checks, uh, particularly as an emerging manager. That was really helpful for us. So we, rather than 150 to 250k minimum investment from an LP, we actually went to 50k, which allowed a lot more people from our community also to actually get into the fund as well. So we're looking at wealth generation too. And so that, I think, helped us get to our first million, which then allowed us to get those anchors and larger checks from institutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a great. But I think to synthesize these both of these points, you know, one warehousing deals is huge. People love to see a fund that already has something in it. I think a lot of LPs actually like to assess ideas more than they like to assess people. And if they see something in your portfolio they really like, they'll often be excited about joining it. Um, and just like Ben was saying, I think targeting individuals is a great strategy. Yeah. Um, Let's, let's just talk a little bit. I think everyone can speak about this, um, different sides of the same coin. You know, what does your ideal relationship, so I'll, I'll start with the LPs here. What does your ideal relationship with your GPs look like after you've invested? How often do you want to hear from them? What do you want to hear from them? Is it just returns that you want to hear about? Or is there other stuff that you want them to know about the portfolio? Um, we'll start with Mark because he looks ready to talk. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, th- I think transparency obviously is paramount. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. Uh, but, you know, I think the, a reasonable cadence of updates, you know, monthly or, or, or quarterly, uh, it seems fine. You know, usually I see quarterly. But I also like his access. Like I'm in probably five or six funds. And uh, but really all of them I can just reach out at any given time and just ask a question via email or, or a phone call and the people will get back to me pretty readily. And so for me, uh, even though some of these funds I'm pretty, I'm relatively small compared to some of the others, uh, you know, to have that sort of that sort of access and responsiveness is really valuable. Uh, Stephanie, yeah, totally agree. And then one thing I also like, so number one, yes, you want like updates, but also getting deal flow access. So being able to also co-invest. So getting access to the actual deals is what most funds now do, right? That's like how they try to get you as an LP. They say, okay, you're going to be able to co-invest alongside us the same terms as we do instead of just like the LP. And then one thing I also think that's important is events. So I'm like an LP in FFBC. I'm here in New York. It's a New York-based fund. They're seed stage fund. They do a lot of LP and poor co-events. So you get to meet the portfolio companies you actually technically invested in, right? So that's like really fun. And they do an entire day around that and they have LP sessions and then they have special specific port call sessions and then they do something together where everybody gets to meet everybody. So I think those are really nice. Has like a nice touch. Yeah. Um, Jenny? Yeah, I think the we, side. whatever you decide to do, like, I think you just, be the, you know, be the outlier, be the best at it. And because you mentioned um, updates, I'll just say we send updates every month and we do it on a Notion doc. Um, So it's just like being updated every month so that they can just like read through it. 
I can't tell you, our LPs love it so much. Like, and it's the easiest thing to do. Like we have a few sections, one's like trends and they love that we're talking about the trends that we're seeing, what we're seeing on the ground. Then obviously we have new investments. We're a high frequency fund. So we're making probably one investment a week. So we talk about those some portfolio updates, what we're doing on events. It's like very simple. It's like really easy for them to read. And we are just so consistent. And we've been doing this now for like five years. And so I'd say it's the number, it's like literally one of the number one things that people just say that they love about it. So um, I think, you know, I guess my my thought is like, whatever the thing that you do you to make yourself stand out with, just like do it really well and you'll get a lot of kudos for that. Yeah, great. And, and then you, you kind of, haven't had the LPs for quite as long, but what have you observed so far? Yeah, I think we're like really big on over communication. I think is the thing that we do, um, like you know, at least once a month, as as mentioned with Jenny. And I think the other thing as well is like really understanding what the LPs want to do as well. So like we're really conscious about how LPs from our network can actually get involved with the startups that we have invested in as well, like as advisors, and and also just like helping them from their industry background and expertise. And so because you know at the end of the day, the startups that we invest in, their success is our success as a fund, and obviously the success of the LPs in terms of Returns and so ensuring that we have that um, that opportunity for LPs to be as heavily involved as they want to be within their portfolio companies, I think is is a really key attribute for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's what we've observed as well. Is a very like every LP is different. You know, and ironically, the bigger the LP, oftentimes the less they want to hear from you, and the smaller LPs are actually. It's almost like part of the the reason for the investment is to learn something and just be part of the process. Um, and I think trying to kind of scale your effort based on the help you is, is important. Um, well, great. Um, thanks a lot, guys. I mean, I think that's that kind of covers, actually, we got through it. Um, everyone was very efficient, so so thanks a lot. Um, and um, yeah, Masha, could you help with sort of the, the pinning and unpinning and this kind of stuff? Thank you, guys. Nice to meet you, everyone. Hey. Is it Gabriel or Gabriel? How do you pronounce it? I, I go by both, whatever. Hey, how are you? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're the, you know, Gabriel is the managing partner at Lobster Capital. Um, he's going to talk about how he launched his first fund um, in 2023. Um, I believe it's a $10 million fund, but he's also a prolific angel investor uh, with many exits. And it's invested more than $30 million, um, I believe, of his own money into companies. Um, so yeah, take it away, get it. Awesome. Um, hey everybody, sorry I'm not at home, but happy to, to take the time to be with you right tonight. So um, actually I want to talk to you about optimism today uh, and how, you know, uh, having an optimistic uh, outlook on, on, on VC and on fundraising really helped me achieve uh, what I did. So I launched a fund in 2023, which was probably one of the worst years to be fundraising, uh, but it's actually one of the top performing in terms of fundraising. We'll see about the performance, of course, in terms of returns. And I believe it's in, in large parts due to my optimism. So let me back up a little bit and kind of introduce myself. So um, originally I'm French, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, multi-entrepreneur with three exits. And I started angel investing with my first check in 2013. So that's 11 years now. I did this on my own. I did not invest 30 million to kind of correct what was said. Uh, of my own money. I did invest 35 million through a syndicate that I created. But when I started investing my own money, you know, smaller amounts, um, I, I started doing this in France. I started doing this on my own. It did quite well. And a bunch of people, you know, a bunch of friends uh, were attracted to that and came to me by saying, you know, oh, we want to invest with you. You've done a few exits. How, how can we invest together? And instead of, ha- you know, having just a group of friends and invest together, which you've seen hundreds of people do that, you know, I invest with five, 10 friends. I said to myself, okay, I want to make a business out of this and I want to grow this. I asked around to some people who had done it before and they told me that's not possible. You don't have the network. You, you, you're not connected. You don't, don't know the right people. And here was my optimism already kicking in. So I thought to myself, you know what? That's okay. I'll just share what I'm doing, share my story on YouTube. I started in French, uh, a, a YouTube channel talking about my journey and talking about investing. And, you know, optimism paid off. That was probably the first the first time where uh, this grew to becoming one of the largest YouTube channel in France about startup investing. And this allowed me to grow my group, our angel syndicate, to become the largest one in France, which is where the $34, $5 million deposit came from. Then 
one morning I woke up and I decided, okay, you know, I'm investing in France. That's good. I want to go invest into, into the best place in the world. That's Silicon Valley. And again, everyone told me, especially in France, you know, oh, you know, you're French, stay in France, stay in your lane. You're not going to be able to access Silicon Valley. You're not going to be able to do that. And optimism. I was like, you know, why not? I can speak hopefully decent English. I hope you guys can all understand me. And, uh, and you know, I can, I'm able to book a plane ticket and go to San Francisco. So here I was, you know, just took my backpack and, and, and my dreams and uh, just landed in San Francisco. And I actually rather quickly in a matter of months uh, made a network for myself there and, and met, met the right people and actually gained access to one of the most reputed, reputed and, and, you know, most difficult incubator to access to in Silicon Valley, which is Y Combinator, which is today uh, the focus of my farm. Again, people told me you cannot access YC. It's not possible. Optimistic. Just, you know, meet the right people. Uh, talk. Be nice. Hopefully, be yourself. And, uh, you know, do the work. And be optimistic about it. And so I gained access uh, to the best startups uh, from my community. I gained access to that network. Now all the way to starting my fund in 2023. And, um, well, you know, there's many of you here who have started a fund who are starting a fund. And, and you probably know how it is. It's uh, painful. And I can tell you that in 2023, it was even more painful. And, you know, I'm not a demigod or something. It was painful for me as well. Every time, you know, you have to talk to people, you have to pitch and pitch and pitch. And probably nine times out of 10, people we say, will say no. Or if you're really good, it's maybe only five times out of 10. But still, we do hear a lot of no. And I noticed I would have some great days and some bad days. Some days you have a great, you have great news. People sign and you're excited. Oh my God, you know, I signed a new LP. And your, your energy level is so high. And, you know, the next calls, are, you're on fire. You're just, you're just so passionate. And some days you get, you get bad news. Someone said yes, but actually, you know, they changed their mind. You expected their check and you just feel bad. And your energy is so low. And we'll have those days up to now. And I, I, would, I would, you know, have those same emotions until I don't really know what happened. One day something clicked. And so this is what I would invite you all to do. If you're fundraising, if you're managing a fund, it's, it's also working if you're an entrepreneur building a business. One day I was kind of fed up with the back and forth, with the ups and downs. So I made a decision. I said, okay, you know, give it all. You have faith into what you're building. You know it's going to work. You know it's something of value. You know, it is interesting because some people have said yes. You know, it is of value. And you cannot keep doing these ups and downs. So I, I'm, I said, I'm going to decide to only have high energy all day, every day. And whatever happens, whatever the bad news, just going to brush them off. So it was really kind of a conscious effort that I decided that, okay, this is going to be my new thing. And every time something bad, you know, bad news, just, you know, brush it off. Like, okay, move on. That's it. And keep the very, very high energy for days, for weeks, for months. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is where we are. So like I said in the intro, uh, my fund, Lobster Capital, investing in YC in the US, um, you know, raised, uh, I would say, one of the most money that, you know, among emerging managers in the first fund, uh, uh, you know, in, in people that I know. So I went through two programs into emerging managers and every time I was uh, um, the biggest raiser or amongst, among the biggest raisers. And again, I believe it's because what I do is, awesome and interesting and YC is really cool, but mostly I believe it's because of my enthusiasm, because of my energy, because of that very simple decision. And, you know, believe me, easier said than done, right? You can decide and after five days, something bad still is going to happen and still going to feel terrible. But every morning I wake up and, and, and I remember the promise to myself, you know, you're going to succeed, you have faith in yourself and don't feel bad. Being rejected is actually a gift. It allows you to move on quickly and know who's not interested so you don't waste time on them. So embrace the no's and just move on and go to the yeses and uh, bring your A-game, bring your energy. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much my journey uh, uh, with optimism and uh, happy to answer any any questions uh, that you guys might have. Hey, Masha, can you read me? Hey, Gabriel. Um, yeah, I really relate to this. I remember um, when we started fundraising in 2013, and I think we pitched 100 people to get three yeses. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's not easy. 
Um, one of the questions that came up in the chat is sort of balancing optimism and realism. And I'm going to change the question a little bit here, which is like, you know, at what point do you learn a lesson from all the no's? Like, at what point do you try to, like, get something from that and improve? And at what point, you know, and at what level are you just like, you know, I actually need to not overcorrect for this no, and I just need to keep pushing and, and stay the way I am? Yeah, that's that's a super, super interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, um, I actually believe you can do both at the same time. I think you can correct with the no. You still, but the thing is, you don't let it get you down. It's not the same thing. You actually be smart about it. Again, a no is kind of a gift. Okay, this doesn't work. So, you know, for me, because I had been investing with a syndicate for a long time, because YC is so famous, I knew right away that it was the right thing. But if you're really, really starting out and you need to correct, I think you can do, you can, you can do both at the same time. Correct. Just keep your energy high. Be, you know, be thankful for the nose, because you know what doesn't work. And again, be smart about it. You know, if it's just one person and one one time, maybe it's not worth changing your whole thumb, right? But it's, if it is several times, of course, you gotta be smart about it and take the feedback. Yeah, yeah, and I think what, that's that's one of the things too is like what what kind of falls into the category of feedback and what is just noise, and you really just have to like take each no as a data point. You can't take each no emotionally as like a difficult thing by itself. Um, one question actually that Max just asked, which I think is probably relevant to a lot of people is, are there, you know, what are the emerging manager programs that you joined, you mentioned two, um, and are there any others you would recommend in addition to those two? Yes, sure. I joined first VC Lab um, that I highly recommend. Uh, it's a, you know, great place uh, and a lot of, a lot of great people and, and you know, very helpful, I think, for, for emerging managers and first time, first time, you know, people raising their first funds. And then I joined Coolwater, um, which I do recommend as well. Uh, however, I do think I did it too early. Uh, it's probably better once you're raising your second fund, uh, probably. Uh, so yeah, those are the two that I know of and that I attended. Got it. Got it. Um, okay, we're going to do one more question here. Um, you know, I think, like you said, you know, it's easy to just decide, okay, I'm always going to be high energy and optimistic, but of course, you know, you're going to have, um, there is going to be something bad to get you down. I remember when we had 20 million under management and we had a $10 million commitment verbally that went back on its word and that almost killed us. Um, and I still, I still think about it. That was eight years ago. Um, you know, what do you do when something really bad happens just like in your headspace? Is it something small, like a cold shower or like, do you have something physical or mental you do to just stay on the, the optimistic track? Yeah, I, I think you kind of pointed into the right direction where you've got to have a trick. So it could be a cold shower, um, uh, you know, things that do work really well for me. And I think for most people is, uh, working out. Uh, just going outside and walking about, you know, and, and just having a fun call, not related to walk, like call your parents, call your siblings, whatever. Um, meditate. That's awesome. You know, meditate is the best. Everything kind of fades away. Your problems are like, you know, I'm just a small person on a big rock in the sky. I'm not going to be here forever. And woof, you feel better, right? Uh, so meditate really, really helps. And then for me, what really works, honestly, is talking to my wife. My wife has have so much perspective. She's like, who cares? You're gonna you're gonna do great, you know. He's lost, blah blah blah. So you know, every time she just puts things into perspective because I told her by my, my, my thing, right? So if you share it with someone, a colleague or, or you know loved one or, or someone close, they're not gonna be they're not gonna have the same emotions as you at the very moment. So you know, say, remember, you want to be happy, so forget about that. Just be happy. Uh, you know, be be optimistic. Yeah. So that really helps for me as well. It happened to me this morning actually. I got bad news from someone. And so that's, you know, when you asked me the question, I thought, I was like, what happened? Why did I not care? Well, my wife said, forget about it. And I was like, okay, sure, honey, whatever. She's, you know, so uh, yeah, that helps as well. Yeah, it was a great study recently on burnout. And it showed that burnout is actually less a product of how many hours you're working. And it's more a product of feeling alone in your work. And I think having someone you're really close with, or whether that's your business partner or spouse or really good friend who you tell everything to, um, can just keep that energy for you for a long time. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Gabriel. Um, we'll let you get back to, to whatever you're up to, um, cause you're on the go here. Um, Masha, can you start working on the pins? Thank you so much. And, uh, if you want to connect, let me on LinkedIn. Thanks. Thanks everyone.
Hi, Danielle. How's it going? Great. Hello, everyone. Joining you all from um, Brook Island in South Carolina. Okay. Um, well, let's um, let me just introduce you briefly here. Um, you are the owner and managing director of Family Office Plus LLC. Um, I was actually checking out yesterday. It's just a huge database of family offices. Um, seems like it's very clean and usable data for a lot of managers. Um, would be great to, to hear a bit more about it and how you got into it. Awesome. Yeah, very happy to um, be sharing with you guys today. And thank you to all the um, speakers that came before me. This is a great group. I had the pleasure of meeting Max in person. I was in Lisbon for the Web Summit in November. So really fun meeting him and, and now being a part of his group. So I'm going to share my screen, just kind of introduce you guys to Family Office List and really um, share more with you just how you can approach family offices and think about building relationships, um, especially as you are, are raising capital. So let's share my screen. everyone see that? <laughs> yeah, we see it. So to understand my whole outlook um, about relationships within the family office sector, it's, it's good to talk about my journey uh, in, in owning family office lists. So I was not the founder. It was actually founded in 2001 by Douglas Fathers. He was a fund manager. Like many, you know, he started raising capital for his hedge fund friends, family. Once he exhausted that and was ready to go to the next level, uh, you know, soliciting ultra high net worth and, and really fell into the world of family offices. There was very little resources available, you know, very opaque. And so he effectively had to build himself a um, spreadsheet of prospects and, and put a lot of hard work, probably like many of you received a lot of no's, um, but as his career advanced, he realized that list was a valuable tool. There was really nothing else like it. So he monetized it and it was family office list. So for years, it was a static Excel spreadsheet. And when I started partnering with Douglas, I really came to the table from a sales and marketing perspective and really wanted to guide our, our clients on how to effectively connect. And I realized a list is really going to encourage this spray and pray mentality. And um, you know, if you've seen one family office, you've seen one family office, it's the same. And it's true. No two family offices are alike. So it really starts with thinking about this from putting yourself in their shoes and doing research and understanding their objectives. Because if you can align based on what they're interested in, you can connect much more effectively and your approach can be one of kind of a value add. Um, so really when you think about the history of family offices, I mean, they've been around for hundreds of years. Many people still don't even know the term and you could actually ask a room full of family offices to define and they would probably all have a different meaning. And this often comes from, you know, how they've structured their family office. Why, you know, is it a single family office, a multi-family office, a family foundation? So it, it does encompass a lot of groups and, you know, as as you know, we, we go through history and we look at certain pinpoints, like in 2008 with the financial uh, crash, you know, it really changed the trajectory and the way that family offices managed their wealth and how they thought about things. And now with, you know, this AI and technology disruption, they are again, you know, pivoting and, and rethinking the way that they're investing. And this has really changed the way that they have, um, shown up and what I'm most excited about on a personal level, um, the next gen are really open to more of an impact investing initiatives and they are looking to raise their families public profiles so that they can invest with other like minded families and help raise awareness for many of these initiatives. So I'm excited at many of the trends I'm seeing in the sector and really working to position myself to offer more value because many of my clients are family offices looking for co-investors, um, raising capital for their own funds. And it's really developing solutions to create more connectivity, more transparency, um, and, and help anyone really looking to connect. Um, so moving on. 
Okay. Did I skip something? Okay. So values alignment. Really, our platform, you know, I decided, you know, this can't be a list, you know, where you're seeing these investors as numbers and not people. We need to know more about each family office, what makes them unique from their origins of wealth and how they're managing that office and really who they are as people and what they stand for. So, you know, our, our platform is much more than just a list of names. It's, it's insights, it's details about the family, and most importantly, their investment objectives. So really, you have to think about, you know, these goals and depending on where they're located, their history, you know, what, what stage, what generation, um, you really want to think about their goals. And typically, family offices make great investment partners because they have long-term uh, patient capital. This is, you know, intended to be for the generations to come. And they often bring, you know, a wealth of network and expertise. Um, and so things that they're really looking at is very relationship-based. They are interested in you, the person. Um, you know, so unique storytelling, connecting on that level, really building trust. And so just sending a blind email is not necessarily the way that you can do that. So we really think about how can we cut the noise? How can we really effectively build these um, connections? And I think in almost every single person's presentation today, we all brought up how our network is kind of our our highest form of net worth it really is and i think linkedin which i love you know following max and his great reach and you know it was that paper that made him went go viral on linkedin is a tremendous tool so really i encourage people to first start with your own network and see where you may have warm opportunities for warm introductions if there aren't any and you struggle there, then see if you can engage, you know, how can you offer value to the people you're trying to connect with and build a relationship? Maybe if they're posting regularly, you can support them and kind of get on their radar. Start a dialogue without necessarily just blindly asking them for something. Um, I also find events really useful. There's a lot of industry events and ways that you can kind of get in the room and, and listen and, and learn, you know, try to build relationships. These things take take times, but they really open doors and the family office community is actually much smaller than you realize. And it's, um, you know, a very referral based. So, you know, oftentimes you can start working with one and it will open the doors to many more. Um, in terms of, you know, pitching again, you, you want to show your passion as the founder, what makes you unique? How are you um, different than maybe some of the other opportunities that they're looking at. And again, it goes back to what are they most interested in and how do you create that alignment? And, you know, I really encourage people when in any industry, whether it's venture capital, whether it's working with with family offices, you know, you your investors are a part of your extended team. You want to make sure that there is, you know, great synergy. You don't just need to see this as, as money. You know, they can bring so much strategic guidance. They can bring so much more to the table. So it almost requires you to ask yourself, but also ask your investors some important questions to make sure that you do have that alignment, that this will be a great partnership. Um, so, you know, who are you? What do you believe in? How do you think about investing? Why is your process unique? And, you know, look about alignment of interest. Again, you know, we Life is too short. We really should have fun at what we're doing and enjoy the people we're working with. So that goes with investors as well. Um, also, you know, just going back to your why, who you are as a person and what drives you. And I think, you know, having that energy, kind of like what Dave Gabriel was talking about and having optimism, I think it goes a long way. And then, of course, you know, what is your exit strategy and, and just kind of the, the heart of the business being able to answer those questions. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. I'm so passionate about no, this. No, this is, this is perfect, Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think the biggest exciting thing for us is we are launching um, version 2.0. I think I, fit, I skipped actually my very first um, slide, which was really kind of the history of this all. Um, so we launched the first version of our platform in 2019, which is really just to create more transparency 
but um, we're getting ready in the next few months to launch version 2.0. And it's really all about, yeah, just kind of trying to bridge that gap. It, it's a tough industry, but we see the need on both ends from capital raisers and the family offices. So yeah, thank you all so much for, for listening and, and having me here today. Um, Asha, can you hear me? You are. Oh, really? Oh, uh, can you unshare the presentation? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. That was my bad. Um, and yeah, let me combine a couple of these questions um, into one question here. Um, you know, what, what percentage of family offices at least that you've observed, are even willing to look at venture capital funds? And then, you know, of those, what do they, you know, what does their due diligence process look like? How long does it take? What are the typical steps? Yes, excellent. All excellent questions. So our database doesn't encompass every family office. You know, there's upwards of probably 15,000. Um, we've curated our list of the 4,100, and it grows every single day. We add about 50 a month. Um, I would say there's probably almost 2,000 firms that are interested in venture. Now, venture funds specifically, that number probably drops down to around 1,000. Um, the thing with family offices, which is so difficult, is there's no one size fits all. Each one has their different process. And so the more that we can gather through how they um, conducted their past investments or you know whether they provided us with their preferences, that will really tell you, you know, how they structure the deal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, also I would add to this is that like, I think a quarter of the family offices that are LPs on our fund told us they had no interest in investing in venture capital and never have and never will, and they still invested in our fund. So you never know, like these people are all, like can all be decision makers that just make a decision at Starbucks and then it just happens. So um, I wouldn't disqualify people necessarily. Um, great. And then is there, you know, one thing that we do at Go Ahead to help our portfolio founders is we kind of have this internal air table and we create a magic link so people can look for their mutuals on LinkedIn, right? Because like you said, oftentimes a cold email from a database is not the best way to reach these people. Um, a few people are asking, you know, what are some strategies that you are seeing that are constructive and, you know, high success rate ways of getting a mutual introduction to a family office. Um, who do the family offices want that second degree connection to be? Yeah, um, honestly, it's just leveraging your network. And I think LinkedIn does is the most efficient kind of way to do that. And part of our um, version 2.0 release will help make that whole process of, of mapping the relationships and, and kind of recommending those um, more, more connected um, leads to you so um you know we we've always strived to understand who's at the helm of making decisions but sometimes you might have that second degree connection with someone else on the team so it's really you know just just leveraging your own network and and i think linkedin is a great way to do that yeah yeah uh, and one one last question here and this is i don't know if you have a great pulse on this or a measurement of it is do you have a sense of, you know, in your time speaking to family offices last year, of what 2024 looks like for them in terms of allocation strategy? Are most of them just going to huddle CDs for longer? Or are they starting to, to go risk on again and start to look at venture assets again? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I always keep a pulse on the trends and the reports. Camden Wealth, they, they, they do a great report. And Definitely, I think that they are looking to to increase allocations again. And I think that there are a lot of new AI tools that are helping with the due diligence. I think that is the hardest component. And that's why we do see an increase of family offices co-investing together. You know, if it's not their area of expertise and they don't have a big built-out team like a venture um, fund would, then they can find a family who maybe does have expertise in that area and they'll co-invest together. Um, so we see a lot of that happening, and I believe that it will just continue into 2024. Awesome. Um, well, on that optimistic note, um, we'll let you go, Danielle. Thanks, thanks so much um, yeah. for the presentation and the answers. Uh, very happy that you joined. Uh, we, uh, we have one uh, more speaker today. Uh, we'll have a fireside chat 
with um, one GP. But before I will invite um, uh, him, I want to open the next card. Uh, the next card. So we'll have. Uh, let me let me show you. We have pretty bad situation, but maybe the next card will will help us. So and this is five. Uh, and uh, probably probably we'll lose, but we'll know the answer after the uh, last speaker. I will show you. I will show you uh, the cards of my opponent. I don't know what, what are they. So please. Uh, Alfred Chuang, uh, GP at Race Capital, raised a 180 million fund uh, in 2023. This is the fund number two. Um, the question is, um, so you you invest, you lead rounds while invested uh, in seed. So what is the uh, um, philosophy behind leading the rounds? Why why is it better for, for VC firms? Well, Max, thank you for inviting me to start with. And actually, it's just so coincidental. I just want to say, um, Fancy was just talking about like some people that you think they never invest in this fund and they ended up investing. I'm actually one of them. So um, this is a living proof. So how it works. And I ended up some of the deals that uh, I ended up investing directly came from Plan C's uh, investment. So th this networking event actually does work. So with that, um, so a little bit about maybe my background that will make this discussion makes more sense. So uh, I um, spent a whole career in Silicon Valley in software tech. I founded a company in the mid 1990s called BDA Systems, which uh, in its 14 years, um, it basically grew revenue to be at just under $2 billion a year. It was a public company for 11 years and eventually got sold to Oracle in 2008, just under $9 billion. Um, and it's in the eclectic um, system middleware business for enabling transactions to happen on the internet. So um, this background is crucial because post uh, the exit of BDA, um, I um, ended up with investing in a ton of companies for the uh, coming 10 years and invested into probably um, majority of the fund that if you cruise on Sand Hill Road. So, I've been on both sides of the camp um, of the investing side. And I think one of the things that I think I have rights with was um, uh, the company that came to me wanted me to write a check as an angel. Uh, they wanted my time because I have ran um, a uh, basically a sales lab motion system software business. So there were times that those were more popular, those are times that they were less popular. But um, those are, that's, but the reason these people come to me was because it's such a lonely um, place to be as a founder. And a lot of first time CEOs have never done this before. They are very scared. And my, um, I think contribution to them mostly is like the shrink of anything and kind of helping them, handholding them through the process. But the only problem downside that I experienced during the process was because I was writing such a small angel uh, check some of those became big, huge breakout companies. That's one is worth $43 billion to privately held. But um, the check that I wrote was too small. I didn't have the rights, like the parada rights, that I should have had as a regular investor. So that's always been a thing on my mind that said, how would I have done things differently? So in 2019, um, this fund get formed, raised capital, specifically was to do this. So um, I contributed a huge amount of capital into our first fund to kickstart it and then um, and and to do this. So with that in mind, I was really mostly prioritizing how much time I'm going to be spending in helping the founders and deciding how big a check we should be writing. Well, obviously, this has to pass conviction, due diligence, you know, market sizing, you know, all that kind of stuff. But when you get to that level of conviction, the way that I look at it is that, you know, you must well be holding enough action and the founder feels that you have enough skills in the game that this is really what ended up I'm going to be obligated to do. That's how it led to how we ended up being a small seed fund. Our first fund is only like 80 some odd million dollars. We're leading almost all the deals that we did for that specific reason. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I would ask you to uh, tell what is your 
strategy to deliver uh, to developing the fund i mean that you started with one fund and you uh, had already experience in vc but for um, new fund managers emerging fund managers what is your advice on how to develop the strategy of launching one fund maybe uh, understanding that your mo model works or like uh, what should be the kpis in order to decide that okay i'm launching the fund two and maybe later uh, the fund three and so on. So, what is the uh, uh, trajectory of a fund manager in uh, in your career? So, I think there are two things to think about, right? In any time that you're running a fund, there's a fundraising side and there's a deployment side. So, on the deployment side, I have to talk, talk about the deployment first and then go backwards on the fundraising. On the deployment, is actually very simple. It's just about return. Your DPI drives who will come back to invest in you. You have great deals and your fund's performance is remarkable, people will come back. So that's the most crucial thing. So you have to invest in good deals, right? And uh, whether you are not going very deep or you're going very deep, it doesn't, I think it's your strategy. What, but I think it's crucial, extremely crucial, to have a very tight thesis so people can understand what your niche is, what your network is. I can't agree more what I heard this morning that the first thing if you have a family office, you have a sovereign fund, you have an endowment that want to invest in you, is to look through what is your specialty and why you have a special trick that only you can get those deals. That can only come from the network. So in our case at Race Capital, we're doing majority of our deal is in software infrastructure, whether it was in 19, we're doing some of the web three infrastructure, web two infrastructure and the cloud, mutating the machine learning infrastructure, data infrastructure, and now in the Gen AI infrastructure. Those are the things that we get very, very focused on. Two is construction, right? You have to know how many deals you have to do, you know, and how many deals you have to do in a year. And then at the end, when you're all said and done, you have enough deals to have the chances to um, be able to have a shot to have a great return fund. So those are, the, I think, the most crucial. Um, I think that's one part. So there's nothing with Trump investing into a bunch of remarkable deals, and that's how most large firms make their name. The second part is fundraising. So fundraising is a, I don't know if I should say this directly, it's a painful process. I know most of my colleagues and friends on the time think, oh, it must be easy for offering. It is not an easy thing. It's never easy, ever, because you are begging for money. Um, and I... Uh, as someone that grown up really as an engineer that turned into a CEO, ran a public company, I, I have some point in my life transitioned myself to a salesperson. You have to put your salesperson on. You're selling a product and you're hoping this product will beat and trump any other financial product in the marketplace. That's why people will play such a long game with you, the investment. So then this directly derived to say the type of LP that you have directly will impact you know, your future funds. Because if most of them don't come back in your future funds, but granted you have to do well, then you have to start all over again. And I, I'm, I think I'm preaching to the choir how hot there is, right? So, and I'm, I hear this story all the time. So we were very fortunate, I think in our first fund, um, through a sequence of circumstances, we got some backers that are very large venture funds themselves. They, 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 they almost never do investment into a fund, they're not fund of funds. But they were so interested in our deals and we were able to present the track record plus the active deal we're working on, they said, we must get involved. So once I have them, um, that things have become a bit easier. That's how we get the sovereign fund, that's how we get endowment, some of that is connection and then the family offices. Um, I ran a family offices, invest through a family office vehicle, not just myself, but with the rest of my family members that were in a whole different business for over a decade. And I don't run it anymore. You know, there's a professional, professional that runs it. Um, you you kind of have to put into them head why they would be doing it. They generally are doing it because um, they have to beat basically the wealth index, right? So if they're ranked 100, they don't want to become 300. They want to become 50. So when you are using money to generate money, you need vehicles to be able to have that kind of return. So you must preach to them that way, right? This is selling. So they have to understand why you have to invest in vehicle like this and play such long game. Everyone would know the story. I love to invest in Airbnb, okay? Uh, yeah, right, okay, who doesn't? But 
if you want to be in that, you have to take some risk. The risk will have to be through managers, right? There's a YC company. You have to invest in YC. You have to invest in your other firms, you know, that were very early with them. So you have to be very tight on the story and have, have things to show for. They have access to those companies more than anything that you will have a chance to do that. And that can trump any return on wealth. So people know that game. So, yeah, and you have to start small and you have to stay on them. I would say LP management is something that generally in our business, people don't do that that well. Um, LPs are your friends. You have to be talking to them all the time. You have to know how they think. What do they worry about? What are some of the direct things they would like to get access to that you can help them with? Um, it's a constant thing, right? And um, uh, I, I think those are things is I would say that would be the most crucial. Thank you. Uh, my my mom, my last question here is: uh, there is temptation to launch an AI fund uh, in 2024, uh, and you did a lot of deals in AI companies. So, uh, what do you think? In what cases uh, fund managers should think about launching the AI fund, and in what cases better to uh, be uh, not not to follow the mainstream? Um, I'm going to use a, a, bit, a little a tiny bit. A short brief of a speech I gave yesterday to a bunch of broad investors. Um, number one is uh, I've been doing this uh, system software thing, enabling enterprise to move from mainframe to distributed computing to the web to mobile to social my whole life. This is what I love. It's something that um, I, I invented the word middleware, and it's the world's most complicated, boring stuff. I, I happen to love it. You know, it's the only thing I know how to do. I'm a one trick pony. But I assure you, uh, Gen AI is Nirvana. This is something that I have been waiting for my whole entire life from distributing transactions into doing um, non-structured data to be able to learn activities, to be able to do machine learning. So now finally arrived to have a neural network that can provide inferences, think like human. This impact will be bigger than we have ever, ever, ever seen in automation, ever. In, in humankind. Uh, every application will be rewritten in the next six to 10 years. Every enterprise application, every consumer application, the way that we use anything will never be the same. Just think down the road five to six years, the way that you're using your mobile phone will be nothing like what we use because there's a uh, intelligence building into the application that instruments things for you. You don't have to be like on a tiny screen, typing in every field and hope the transaction will go through. We're still doing that. Come on, right? So finally, this will be stopped. This opportunity is bigger than anything. So if you ask me, say, well, should we have an AI fund? That's a ridiculous statement because everything will be AI. Every application will be AI based. Every bank will be AI based. Telco will be AI based. Pharmaceutical will be AI based. So this will be like, uh, will you have a separate fund to invest in the internet? That will be such a dumb thing to do. Now, these temptations happens all the time. I remember so clearly. So one of my colleagues um, in uh, 2022, 2022 was a spectacular year for crypto. Remarkable, right? And I'm looking at, some, well, thank goodness that we mark all the things that cost, you know, the, the, the multiple of the stuff that we're generating was just frightening. It was bigger than anything I've seen. Obviously, it crashed at the end of 2022. There was so much temptation that people were coming in my own firm coming to me and say, Alfred, we should turn the whole firm into a crypto firm and we should turn the whole firm into RIA so we can be doing hedge also. And um, I think uh, it's short of me throwing a chair at the wall. We, I stopped it. Thank goodness we didn't do that, right? Because it's only lasted months and then the whole world went and blew. Um, remember, technology can never be the one pony that you run either because our job is to generate return. If there's much religion I have on AI, I'm not going to say my fund is just only do IB because there are other enabling factor to make AI happen. The cloud's going to change, right? Because we don't have enough GPUs. This is a current problem. In the future, we're going to have a distributed cloud problem because now people already started. You guys know, right? They don't go to one cloud to train because there's not enough resources. They already gone to all three. So if they've got, and their specialty cloud that's coming up, they're funded by various companies like NVIDIA. So, by default, cloud changing. That's worth investing. That may not be directly AI, but that's crucial for us. So I would highly recommend 
Don't get religious. Don't say today AI is hot. Let's do an AI fund. Fun is ten years long. Don't go get stuck in anything. I will also th th thank you, Alfred. I will also ask you one question from the uh, comments. Uh, so, what uh, what advice can you give to founders that are fundraising? Um, so maybe uh, from from the perspective of founders, uh, what do you think is uh, the best practices for fundraising? Um, that was that's without doubt. You know, I'm I'm not an economist. Um, 2023 was probably one of the toughest years I've seen. It was extraordinarily tough. You know, the largest fund was investing in the 25 percent volume of deals in, in 2023, and um, even our own stats. You know, I, I actually the number of companies we saw more than double from 22 to 23, but then the number of deals that we actually did was almost halved. It just we just got very cautious because uh, as early stage investors, you know, a lot of you guys are first time fund doing early stage stuff. When you're doing early stage, you have to make sure those companies survive long enough. That means have enough cash to be able to raise the next round to be able to have live another day. When you run out of money, it's game over. So to me, I think the most important thing is uh, to really focus on that. I, I think we got very loosey-goosey in startups and lots of founders without experience thought the world's forever going to be like 2021 and 2022. So we're spending money like that way. I mean, this is not news to everybody. I think this is a heart reckoning for everybody of what happened in 2023. Personally, I don't think 2024 is going to be anything as bad as 2023 at all. So I think um, this will be a uh, continue improving fundraising environment. We will see VCs in all stages to be more active. Obviously, late stage are highly driven by the IPO market, right? So when you have no terminal exit, even though I think M&A is you know, pretty active at this point, more active than it was, still, the growth deal is going to be very cautious. So that always will be the thing that you'll be pegging up to that's concerning. So for I think I will highly recommend to every founder, one is really, really careful with your spending. Give yourself nine months before you run out of cash to really actively start fundraising. Build great relationship with um, uh, venture firms because venture firms, they are not doling out money like they were. And those really interesting VC that were like writing checks on the fly on the clock, they're all gone. So now they want to go through all the past due diligence, you know, and checking with the customer, thinking through the pieces. So you really have to convince them, you know, through a set of process. And that's crucial. And you have to be patient. But don't run out of patience on them. Don't cop an attitude. So I, I you know, I, I think uh, it's, it's much better time ahead. But start thinking longer, give yourself more time uh, to get a deal done. It takes a while these days. So just be cautious that that's how I advise all of my founders myself. Yeah. And remember, people are looking for great product market fit. That's going to be the most crucial thing. The absolute revenue number will move up and down, whether you're raising an A or a B. But, but you have to have product market fit. You have to be able to prove that. Very got to focus on that. Super, super, Alfred. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you, yeah. Abri Gadu, which is uh, thank you in Portuguese to to our team um, organizing this conference. I want to say Abri Gadu to all our speakers and participants, and to uh, the moderator uh, of our sessions today. Before you go, so we we had uh, we have three small parts left. The first is. Um, our call to actions. So um, if you want to contribute to your VC hack on either fundraising, uh, creation, deal flow, or uh, investment decision making, so there will be the link in the chat. If you also want to um, join our wait list for GP sessions or GP online meetups, maybe in February or March, so also there is a link. And if you want to join the uh, Venture Studio family community, also, you have the link. Um, then we have second part, which is which is uh, opening the cards. You remember there is my opponent here, uh, a bear playing poker very well. So he he knew that I will go all in with very bad cards. And we have stakes. So our stakes today. Um, uh, first of all, 
Uh, if I lose, I will not. I will not eat sugar for next one month. Um, some people join this challenge with me. Uh, if I win, I will eat a piece of a piece of this cake. Actually, just uh, 15 minutes ago, uh, uh, 15 minutes ago during Alfred's uh, speech, my son uh, came back home with my wife and saw the torch. And probably there is one foot less because he took took already something. Um, yeah, and, and my biggest take is uh, I saw in some films, movies, or videos on YouTube that some people uh, put their cake in face. Or usually uh, they're not doing for their, their face, they're doing it for somewhere, uh, someone's uh, other face. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's open the cards. I don't know. Um, I think that there is a, maybe... A, 25% chance that I win, maybe 20% chance because the, my biggest card is Jack and no, uh, nothing, nothing here. So these are two cards and now I'm opening them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we, we all will be more healthy, more healthy. So this means that I lose, I lose. This cards win for those who don't know the the rules. Um, so we all will become healthier during the next one month. Uh, all people who participated in in this game uh, and yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, I wanted. I thought, I thought, okay, our previous two conferences we all with some special uh, with some special. Um, Cringe at the end. So I thought today I want to decline this uh, this cringe in my conferences, decline this craziness. So I thought let's give it fifty percent chance. But uh, the the destiny is I will continue and do this. I never did it. So um, if you if you want to become a bit more healthy, so uh, you have to um, how to say. Eliminate sugar for the next one month. I will do it, and uh, yeah, for to make this conference more memorable. Yay! Good job. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but there is uh, the third part of our Indian. Uh, yeah, probably I don't need glasses more. And then I want to encourage you to put some mask. I see a lot of people with masks. <laughs> yeah, super. Okay, so a lot of people with masks. Let's uh, let's do some video effects. You know that people who uh, who have some uh, macOS system, they have some special video effects. Happy, happy to, uh, for your support. Oh yeah, I need I need to show my my head uh, to make the mask work. Uh, yeah, making the final, the final screenshot uh, here. Yeah, super. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, during our next conferences, we are finishing. If you want, you 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 can unmute. So uh, this we did it earlier also, and th this time we also d uh, did it. I'm a I'm a I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a a Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B